What up, though, One Pride? This is the Roar of the Lions UK podcast, the podcast where One Pride goes worldwide. My name is Anthony Fitzpatrick. I'm joined by Ryan McCluskey. It is a Wednesday evening, and for the first time in a couple of weeks, it is the College Football Podcast. And, Ryan, we are about 40 days away from the NFL draft now. Most of the path to the draft is over. We're on the last few pro day circuits here. How... How are you feeling now? All this is coming to an end and the big show is soon to begin. Uh, for us, the Detroit, I'm still none the wiser because, like I say, a lot of things that, like, we've addressed some free agency need now. There's multiple directions if we can go in. There's no real glaring holes. But, yeah, for the first time in a long time, I feel like we could go in any direction. And then now I think that the draft is kind of like, there are some like players and positions that look, they just look concrete. Like you so say, you can start to form patterns like the top five, four quarterbacks and a wide receiver pretty much looks locked in now. After that, like I say, it's a bit shaky. But yeah, you, you start to now have a good idea of who's going where. We've seen some trades as well already. Like I say, I imagine a lot of them most of the time. But I think a lot of the teams now have a good, probably have a good idea who they're taking. I, I don't know about you. I have a feeling like the first round's going to be utter chaos this year because, you know, obviously the Bears now, Justin Fields is gone, kind of figures like they're going to do something. But then you've got Commanders, you've got the Patriots. It's like, are they going to try and trade a farm away for somebody? You've got so many sort of hawks beneath who kind of need to come up for guys. But it it's just so fascinating, isn't it? Because I said the other day, if you did like a top five on skill in this draft, there should really only be one quarterback in there. Let, let's face it, there, there shouldn't be this many but because of need, demand, etc. I tried to do a mock yesterday and it took me like three hours to do a first round mock draft. I just ain't got a Scooby. No, because let's say you've got teams like the Vikings, the Giants, and for me, the New Orleans Saints, who don't right now, don't have their quarterback of the future. Three teams that are not positioned to get a quarterback will have to trade up for a quarterback and will upset the apple cart. Those three teams, realistically, they need to do something. And Minnesota are already trading with the Texans to gain extra capital. That tells me Minnesota's trade. Minnesota needs a quarterback, and I think that this is probably the year they're going to get him. They will move up if they have to. The Giants, for me, are the, the, they're the curious team. The Sat six. Jones sat there, like say, on a shed load of money, just let say Quan walk. Like say, they're not going to get the top four guys unless they literally jump the charges. But it won't come cheap. If they just sit there, they could really lose out. So yeah, this is a this doesn't feel like a good year to need a quarterback because you're gonna have to you have to rapidly climb up the board here. And it doesn't feel like like I feel like there's one bona fide starter this year. Caleb's probably the only guy who's ready to start day one. The rest of them you feel like they're gonna need to sit. They're not just gonna come in and start day one. And and that's the issue. And then you've got the added little niche of our team's going to decide, am I going to trade back? Like if I'm Washington, do I trade back for a haul? And then do I go for Bo Nix instead? Or do I go for Penix instead and, and do it? Teams can go forwards or backwards depending on the risk here. This kind of adds another layer to it. Yeah. Like the Vikings, they're in no man's land. Like I said, they've got to go back. Got to go forward, sitting at 11. Like, say, he's no good for a Bonix or a Penix because it's too high. And they won't get anywhere near a... I don't think they'll get anywhere near a JJ McCarthy or a Drake Mayer without cracking the top six or seven. So, yeah, they can't sit. Like, they go forward or go back. Exactly. So, yeah, anywho, we'll get on to the more intricacies of the draft a little closer to the time. As for today, we're going to take a little look through the pro day scene because that's what we're on now. Pro day's last stop on the path to the draft. A lot of them have taken place, but the big, big 12 pro day is going to happen next week. Still a few big ones, especially going on today as well. Alabama are having theirs. So we're going to have a look at maybe a few of the guys we've been impressed with on the pro day scene, have a little chat about that. And then because everybody loves a good list, we've, we watch all these guys in college. We've watched them for years. Now we've seen the all-star games. We've seen the combine for most of them. We've seen the pro days. We have compiled our little lists of players per position who we like the most out of this draft. So this is not just saying it's a straight up one to five. These are the best guys. These might be 
specific fits for the Detroit Lions, who, who we do think is the best. These are kind of the list of the guys we specifically really like going into this draft. So we're going to go through those lists, just have a little explanation for the players as to why they are on there. And all good fun because it creates a lot of debate. Just first and foremost, just need to get through all the housekeeping. Royal Lions UK Discord, if you want in on that, just let us know. We'll fire the link across for that the main podcast. Um, Matt and Ash did the pod this Monday, just gone, just recapping free agency, taking all your questions as well. So if you've not heard that yet, do go and give it a check out. And next week, we start our positional groups because the main podcast starts to sort of link into what we do here. They'll be looking at prospects for the offensive line going for because we may have got Kevin Zeitler, but we've got two tackles we need to pay next year. Zeitler's going to be here for one year. Glasgow's 31, and Ragnow, who knows, with his injury. So make no mistake, it is still high, or should be high, on the Lions draft board. So we're going to take a look at some of our favourite guys for that. Don't forget to like and sub to everything. Twitch, YouTube, all that good stuff. Don't forget about Lions Nation Unite, Herman Moore's pet project to bring together the best in Lions content creators across YouTube land. Don't forget we are an affiliate on Twitch. We're monetized on YouTube. We have a tip jar, so if you want to help us that way, great. But we just love having you all in the building. And we've got a feedback form as well. So any hints, any questions, anything you want to, you know, put in the shows, anything you'd like us to do, just let us know. We will take that on board. Um, as for anyone who will be watching at the minute, this is pre-recorded because my streaming is still a little bit funny, but I will be in the chat, hopefully, whilst the premiere is on. So if you want to ask questions or anything, just ask away and I'll I'll chat with you in the live chat as the show goes on. And with us being so close to the draft now, if you've got any questions or anything, put them in there. I can add them in to later shows as well. Right, let us go straight down into things. And first, I mentioned we're going to talk a little bit about Pro Day. So, you know, um, our views on here... Pro days for us don't really matter too much in the grand scheme of things when it comes to the evaluation of players coming into the draft. However, for some, it is a necessary if you want to get scouts' eyes on you, if you want to show your one little last chance to perform in front of them. And for some guys, it can prove very valuable. And we're going to come on to one guy specifically first, right before I ask you about any guys you've liked during this process. But... The one who you've been batting for the longest before anyone had really ever heard of him, because he hasn't been playing in America. He comes from across the border up in Canada. But Quantes Stiggers, the guy who is creating a lot of chatter in draft land, because I say he's not played high school football. He's just gone up to play in the CFL. Well, he on his pro day. 30, sorry, 29 of 32 teams came to see him. He's got a visit with the Detroit Lions. We know that he's got top 30 visits as well on there. And what a day he had. He posted a 36 and a half inch vertical, a 10 foot eight broad jump, and he had a 445 in the 40 yard dash. And in his positional drills, he just looked really really good every bit a very draftable prospect now when you first started talking about him right all those months ago people just saw undrafted free agent you know guy who might pick up on a practice squad something like that but the man has played his absolute heart out in the shrine bowl he got snubbed for the combine he says i don't care i'm gonna go to my pro day i'm gonna wow the socks off everybody is Quantes Stiggers going to have a draft pick put on him? And if so, how high is it going to be? I think not going to the Combine has now worked in his favour. Now, because he couldn't meet with everyone there, they've been forced to go out and see him. And like I say, the whole league is now sent out representative to his pro day. He has gone from a UDFA practice squad that will probably end up in Canada again to for me, a six for a seven round draft pick. Yeah. I think he is now firmly in the territory. He will have his name called and he will have a rookie contract in the NFL from the sixth round onwards. Yeah. He's tested incredibly well. I say the numbers are good. 
the tape from the CFL that backs up the agility, the athletic testing that is put on there. I like say the ability to show that he'll put on weight, he'll get stronger. The measurables are very solid. And he has the whole chip on his shoulder kind of attitude that I'm the forgotten man, that Canadian football is disrespected, it's looked down upon. Anyone that comes out of the CFL is automatically disregarded. And that's a good fire in his belly to have. I think it's a good fuel for him to try to change that narrative because it's, it's been a stigma that's existed for a long time in the game. And it just takes one one player to maybe change it. We've seen guys like Jason Wake and that in the past before, but still, it's been a bit of a barren run of Canadian guys and ex-CFL players cracking the NFL. And like I say, Stiggers, uh, uh, Macho, we're going to, two guys this year are making a serious case to try and get that. And Quantas, yeah. And yeah, he's a just he's a fascinating story and that kind of like, it, it just works for him. People just kind of want to get to know him because he's taken that unorthodox route to professional football. And now you look at it and you think he probably would have been good enough to play in college. Like I say, he would have probably played Division One football had he been given the chance to if he'd wanted to. But now he bet on himself, went to play fan controlled football. Like I say, basically just skipped the whole amateur and kind of just went pro. And yeah, and he's gone full circle. And he's only like, what, just turning 23. So he's not even that old, despite the fact that he's been around around on the scene a long time. So yeah, he's the kind of guy I can see the Lions throwing six, seven round pick at. They won't let the, they're not going to wait till the Wolves get him in UDFA and they're not going to fight for him. They'll just say, if we want him, we'll go get him. But I think actually might a few other people now will probably take that chance on him too. So yeah, the, the, he's created a bit of a frenzy. Yeah, and it's kind of who's going to pull the trigger if anyone's going to pull the trigger. But he measured in well. What was he, 5'11", 204? That's kind of really what you want, isn't it? It's, it's almost perfect. It's not too undersized. I think perfect weight, really, as well. Yeah, that's uh, Kool-Aid and McKinstry. I think that that I think that makes it makes him almost identical size to Kool-Aid, who people talk about as a first-rounder. And Kool-Aid also ran a 4'47". So, athletically, he has matched everything that Kool-Aid did earlier today, but with literally half the fanfare. Yeah, and like I say, he's been playing against proper adult players in the CFL as well, not been against high school kids either. So, this is this is the story that keeps on going. And like I say, maybe all it takes is one guy. Because you think of the CFL, and like you say, how hard it is for defensive backs up there. You figure bigger it's teams, almost... Bigger end zones. It, it's, it's a league that is designed to make life worse for defensive backs. Yeah. It's harder. Everything they do is harder. Like say, like they literally have slot backs. Like they're not they're moving in line of scrimmage. They get a run up. Like I say, they're not static at line of scrimmage. So they're already going at full speed and you've got to recover. Playing cornerback in the CFL, I suppose in some ways is harder than playing cornerback in the NFL because the rules are weighed a lot more heavily against you. Exactly. So you go. You've got to figure that stands in his favour. Played against adults, he played in a harder league in terms of you know putting it against you. But Quantes figures it is the story, and it just feels like he's going to be done now. Just everyone's with. I'm pretty sure I've been introduced to his mum on Twitter now as well. Is it his mum who's been really big on Twitter recently? She's just been everywhere promoting him, and it's just like it's such a great thing. Or it's at least one of his family members. But yeah, we will see what happens with Quantes. Quick. Aside there, you did mention Kool-Aid. Obviously, it's the Alabama Pro Day today, and he has been injured. Oh, what is it? The Jones fracture? It's got, they yeah. call it the Jones fracture. And he ran a 447, and it's just kind of like he's he's running with the injury. He's going to have surgery on Friday to have this injury sorted, and he'll be ready for training camp. But it's like, that, that's kind of crazy that he can run at that speed with a fracture in his foot, and you're like, oof. He's done himself no harm with that because obviously he didn't test at the combine, but he's he's put himself right back in that consideration in the top swathe of cornerbacks because there's so many. Yeah, and a 10.1 broad jump as well. So the only two drills he did do, and it's one of those things, if he knew he was injured and he's tried to hide it, I don't care. I don't care if he's trying to keep it to himself so he didn't work out what he didn't want in medical because he didn't want it to come out and like I say, he's kept it to himself. End of the day, he's had to come out because, like I say, he's going to proceed on the foot. So it, it can only hide it so long. So it doesn't really matter. And it's not like he's not turned up to the pro day. 
like you say, he's literally done, he's done something. And I always think doing something is better than doing nothing. Especially when, like say, guys had jumped above him and they were they were they were bumping him down to a second rounder. Like say he's still firmly in contention of that middle to back end of the first round. Yeah, I, 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 I still, I'm high on him. I'd say he's been up and down at times, splash players, sometimes he's been burned. But yeah, I'd say he's athletic, kind of just plays on instinct. I'd say he's just very, just very blase and raw about it. But yeah, I think he's the kind of guy that we need. I, I'd say he's the kind of guy that's going to give up big players, but he's going to make big players as well. And that don't bother me. Not out of a rookie, but yeah, a good day for him. And yeah, he'll have the he'll get his foot cleaned up. And they said, I think he'll be ready for training camp. So it shouldn't. I don't see why anyone would be put off by the injury. Like no. by letting him slide. No, and like I say, he's he's actually he, he could have just chosen not to do his pro day and like I'll go and get the surgery. He's actually shown the willingness to want to do it. So anything shows grit there, but it, absolutely great there in terms. Of what he's done, Kool Aid. We'll see what happens. The cornerback class is ridiculously loaded in this upcoming draft, all the way through days one through three. In terms of other guys who have sort of really <laughs> accelerated their stock, I guess one of the big stories, right? In terms of, because you know, we've we've been saying this wide receiver class pretty good especially at the top of the draft. There could be six, seven guys up there, but there's a new name there now, which really wasn't around as we were coming through the season. Even at the end of the season, it wasn't there, but he's got one of the best names going. Lad McConkey with Georgia. He lit up the combine with how he did there, but in terms of his pro day, he put up some big numbers in events he didn't do. So he had a 439... 40 at the combine but at his pro day he did a 397 short shuttle which would have been number one of all positions like literally all positions not just wide receivers at the combine the quickest of everybody and he did a 672 three cone which would have been fourth amongst everybody and once again people have just said during his positional drills the route running everything is just crisp and smooth and looks Ray and it it kind of doesn't sync with the college tape, which just makes you take a little bit of pause as to why he's not done a little bit more in his career. But in terms of knocking an off season out the park, like he's had one of the biggest rises of everybody. Like he's he's up there with those top six guys now. People are putting him in that group and above some of the established guys from before. Yeah, I I've seen people think he might go at the end of the first round. And I say some people hate that, some people love that. And yeah, the college tape or the college stats, they don't do it justice. But when you look at who he's had to play with, who he's had to share snaps with, who has taken all the targets in the time that he's been there, who he's had to kind of work around, it's kind of understandable. Like I said, there's been a lot of mouths to feed and he's done the best that he can. Would he have played better and got more stats at another school? Absolutely, of course he would. I say, would he have? Would he have come into a draft with as much hype? Uh, at another school, probably not. No, I say not the pro offense, not the players that's played around in the system, and yeah, athletically, and like how he's worked, he has been off the charts. I say, and I can see him being a really good pro. And yeah, I think he is up there. As like you say that. Six, seventh best wide receiver that could end up being the second best in three years. And we look back to say, yeah, he was an absolute steal. And I think some teams will really value what he does. And yeah, I like the kid. He's likable. Like I say, he's a hard worker, busts his balls, and he kind of just wants a chance. Probably feels a bit disrespected as well. Like I say, that he rarely is getting mentioned with, like I say, like I say, the guy listed, like, I know I ain't heard him mentioned over any of these guys in the last couple of weeks, and I don't see him get any attention over any of them. But it won't surprise me if he had a better career or a better rookie year than most of them. If you yeah. if he lands on the right team, that is. Yeah, yeah, it's all about fit with these guys. Like even the most elite guys, it's where you land. 
can really heavily impact what happens in your career. So, but yeah, Lad McConkey has been knocking it out the park there in terms of maybe some lesser guys who've been boosting up their numbers through pro days again. I mean, he's one of your favorite players and he has been for a while. The, the lesser known Italian pastor, Hannah Bortolini, continues. He's now, I've now seen him. Gosh, like on most mock draft simulators, he's in the 200s. Most mocks I see him in now, he's in day two and like rightfully so. I would love him to come here, but like he's, I think he's one of those who's been underexposed. People haven't really been familiar with his game, as they say. They've seen him train now, they've seen him practice, and they're like, actually, Wisconsin may suck as a team, but he himself has been really good. And he should be, he should be up there in the draft. He should be in these day two picks. Yeah, he's gone from a guy that was a uh, two to two twenty plus to now what seventy to a hundred and twenty. Let's see, yeah, let's say he's a third, fourth round guy from a guy that was getting no attention. I'd say that's firmly where he deserves to be. As you say, Wisconsin, they're not a sum of their parts. Like they're a terrible team, and their football has been terrible. And a few of the guys that have not been the cause of that have really got lost in the whole thing. I'd say a few standout guys have done everything they can the last few years and they've come out and had no love, no attention. They've just been clumped together and branded as, like say, failures. And if anyone wants, like say, a, uh, a fairly well-sized, athletic, physical run mall that gets to the second level that you don't have to start straight away, but come in at the end of his rookie year, ready to start next year, then he's probably one of them guys, yeah. He won't have the first, second, third round because, like I say, he's, he won't start yet. But if you're drafting him, it's because you've got starters and you need future starters because you don't want to pay starters or they're going to retire. And that means, like I say, he's someone that Detroit should absolutely look at because in the next year or two, we're going to have big question marks around a lot of our offensive line. So someone that can come in pretty quickly in a run first, pretty heavy scheme, which we need. I said that will carry it'd be worth its weight in gold. So yeah. Interior offensive line class this year is difficult because there's not a lot of true guards, not a lot of true centers. And he's played a lot of snaps also at center, which carries a lot of versatility. It's a whole just a mishmash the all line class this year. But yeah, he it's kind of hard to keep your head above water, but he's doing his best to he's treading water, like I say, and it's really hard in this class. He's trying to stand out because it's it feels deep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he's certainly taken advantage of this off season. Like he's one of the biggest risers come on the offensive line. Again, you say on the interior, it is a mismatch. So if you're going to get guys who are going to start in future years to come, he certainly should be right up on your radar there. And quickly speaking of the Badgers pro day, it's annoying because again, it's been mentioned on this show a lot, but Raylan Allen still refuses to do any athletic testing and you kind of figure in this running back class it's what a wasted opportunity for him yeah it's it's going to be a game of snakes and ladders like you say he's gonna he's gonna slide it's going to be a slippery slope uh, like you say i suppose the people can they kind of see through the fact that he's just an absolute giant kid with big muscles and he's physical. When you look at the other things, like you say, you look at what he lacks or what he's not willing to do right now or show, like you say, won't run a 40, just wants to bench, like you say, won't show you the cones, like the, the jump stuff. Like, I don't know why. Like, there's not He doesn't stand to gain anything from not having a go at everything. The numbers, I think he's probably worried that the numbers will be bad. And are bad numbers worse than no numbers? I suppose that is the, the greatest mystery of all time. If he runs a terrible, let's say he runs a 4-7, is that worse than not running a 40? Maybe it is. Maybe he's trying to do damage limitation. But yeah, right now, like you say, from a, a, a college star or what should have been a college star, it just feels like as a pro, like he's just going to be completely forgotten. 
Yeah, or at least he's going to have to work harder to get on a team for next year rather than going sort of he's like a... end up in a practice squad. Yeah, rather than being like a fourth or fifth round pick that gets in as running back three automatically or something like that. It, may, it might just be a little bit of a, a run there for him. Um, so in terms of the most intriguing school of the lot, now the pro days are done, given everything again that's gone off in this offseason, I feel like this one school, I don't know whether you agree that... It is the most intriguing school now in this entire draft. And that's the Sunbelt champions, the Troy Trojans. You have Kamani Vidal, you have Javon Solomon, you have Reddy Stewart, Richard Gibonor, all these guys. Every single one of them seems to have smashed every single ball out the park. This are all you've heard is good things about these guys. And I'm at the point now where I would like a Troy Trojan on my roster come next season. This is, you know, we know it as a school, especially on the defense. They are tough. They are hard. They're one of the most elite defenses in the country. They have been for years. But these guys now are athletically testing to the point where people are taking notice of them in general. Even, you know, guys who usually sniff at group of five prospects, they all have really risen this year. Yeah. They've had a fantastic off-season, like say, from the Shrine Bowl, the Senior Bowl, the Pro Days, the Combine. Like I say, Vidal has looked, he's not looked out of place of all the power five running backs. Like he's held his own. He's arguably been coming off a better year than nearly all of them do, statistically. Like I say, just absolutely destroy it. Javon Sullivan, like you say, that that kind of defensive line, that, that tweener edge stand-up, it's a hard one to judge, and it's one of those where you get it really right or you could get it really wrong. But he's firmly in that group of guys. Like, say, you've got guys like him, like Kamara. Like, you've got those, like, they're, they're, they're going to change. That like, They're not everyone's cup of tea, depending on what front you play. But for some other teams, they will offer crucial depth. So, yeah, like I say, and, and this feels like uh, the, the coming of Troy having, like, two, not just a good year, but, like, three good years back-to-back-to-back to back to back stacked. Their previous draft classes have kind of not materialised, but this year it's all just kind of come at once, like I say, because they've been so good. So it feels like it's really well-deserved. And a few of these guys are going to have their names called. Like yeah. Say, and hopefully we'll go on to make plays on Sundays. And Troy will just reload next year, despite losing maybe its best crop of talent it's had in a long time. They will just reload. You're absolutely right. You know how many players they had at their pro day? They're their own. 18. Like... That's a good chunk of a roster there to have 18 players ready, four or five of whom are certainly going to hear their names called at the next level. I know the Packers are all over Kamani Vidal like a rash, but Solomon is the guy, like, he's the undersized, you know, the arms are a bit short and people go, well, he's not going to do it at the next level, but every single move in the book as a pass rusher and it's just been great as a run defender because that's what Troy do. You stop the run, you've got to stop the run if you want to rush the passer there. It's one of those things you've got to earn the right. He does both really well and people are taking notice. So sometimes this is what the pro days are for, just a little bit more exposure for these guys. You mentioned Kamara. Actually, the Colorado State guys have also balled out as well. That is Dallin Holker as well, tight end extraordinaire, Mohamed Kamara, another school that's going to have good success in the draft this year. And the pro day backed that up. Yeah, two guys that <clears throat> I think really don't get enough respect to their respective positions right now. I, well, st- spoiler, Hulk is in my top five. And like you say, it's, okay, it's one year, but what he did in that one year going into a tight end class for me that is very top weak, like you say, he's, he's, it's fallen perfectly for him. Last year's class, he would have got no love. And he might have really struggled to compete against the guys like uh, Dalton Kincaid. You'd have had, uh, I'd say, you'd have had Sam Laporte. You've had guys like that that he might have struggled to go against. But this year, he stands a lot better weight, and that 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 great year has come off. Does stand him in good stead to definitely have his name called somewhere anywhere between tiers two and three. But Mohamed Kamara, yeah, undersized, but a pass rush specialist. One of the best pass. One of the best not. Not if I forgive it, but for, if you're looking for tools, like if you're looking for flashy plays, the tricks, that he knows what to do because he's only like 6'1". But I say to get what 
like I say, two years ago, like 17 sacks, like you led the nation, like say 18 months ago. You don't do that by accident. You can't just do that. And if you don't, if you're only six one, like 240, he's not doing that by pure strength, is he? He's not winning the leverage. Yeah. He's winning with speed. He's winning with spin moves. He's winning like by ripping hands, by pulling away, by learning how to disengage and use stunts. Like he's had to learn to win in other ways because his body basically stopped going a long time ago. And he's not going to be able to win that way. So for me, he's a very intriguing prospect. Some teams will absolutely love him. Some teams will absolutely go low, look at, look at him, straight away based off the like measurables and go, no, he's out. He's not on the board. And that's what I like about him, like I say, because he'll go out there and he will, all the teams that rate him off, like I say, he'll go out there to try and prove them wrong. And he'll yeah. have a pretty big chip on his shoulder. And again, like I say, he's he's built fairly similar to James Houston, which probably puts him on the Lions board, even though they've retained Houston. Like yeah. that, the fact that there were I mean, people are thinking we might not tells me I say there might still be a job later one. So I would I'd throw a flyer at Kamara on day three if he's there. Like it, it doesn't fear me. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. And if he does turn into a an elite third, fourth down specialist pass rusher, which he should be, then that's a good way to make a living in the league these days. Exactly. And we know the Mountain West sends plenty of defensive talent to the NFL. Like, you get a lot of guys who come up, they are worthy of it. Might be a power, might be a group of five conference, but it doesn't mean the talent's not there. On defense especially, you get a lot of NFL players, so he absolutely can do it. Hulker is really interesting as well, but... Uh, before we end this, is there anyone else like pro day wise or anything you've been intrigued with? Who's dropped anything else? I don't. Cade Stover, I feel is is very interesting. I say not heavily used at Ohio State because Titans never have been up there historically. Go back years, Titans they've just not really been a factor. I say, and but for me. I feel like he's probably got a lot more to offer and he must have been underutilized. I've had a look for the pro day results today off by more, but I ain't got it. But he did pretty well at the combine. He looked all right. Another case of like say the class isn't great and someone will like what he has to offer. I'd say because he could be a sneaky good receiver. So I feel like obviously the pro day at High State was overshadowed by someone not working out. That was great for the other people that were working out. So I think Cade might have a chance to, I think someone might have a chance to sneakily take him fairly high. Was it Was it not funny? Like, because obviously you just mentioned Marvin, Marvin Harrison Jr. They've done no testing whatsoever. He told everyone he wasn't going to test. And then when today came and everyone's like, oh my God, he's not going to test. It's like, told you weeks ago. And everyone's just up there acting shocked. It's like, you know, he does. I don't think he needs to prove a thing. I think he's been told. Like some teams already, like maybe the Cardinals have gone. Look, we're going to draft you. Don't bother testing. You're getting picked. There's, there's literally there's no point, is there? Because some guys at the top do that. They are told where they're going, so there's no need. Yeah, when they do their interviews, like I said, they meet with teams. They literally say, "If you fall to six, you're coming here. If you make, if you don't make it past so and so, we'll draft you." Like I say, should they tell them that? No, can you stop him? No, that does, it don't matter. Any day, you don't risk injury, like I say, because he knows he's probably, like I say, other than Joe Alt, he's going to be the first non quarterback off the board. And people say, oh, he's, he wants to tank because he do not want to go to certain teams. He has got no say who drafts him. No. Like the whole Cable Williams, like, I don't want to be a bear. Cable Williams don't have a fucking thing, no matter. He's going to be a bear. I say, I don't care if you don't want to be a giant, Marvin Harrison Jr. Like, if they're, if I sat there, you're going to be a giant. And mm. I don't care if you don't like Daniel Jones. Like, it, it's tough. It just don't work like that. And like I say, if he knows where he's going or roughly he's going to, why is he going to speak to other teams? Why does he mm. need to do interviews? Why does he need to do stupid aptitude tests, for God's sake? Why does he need to do the square root of Pythagoras or some bollocks about counting beans? That stupid stuff like that. Yeah. He's got an agent. Anyone wants to talk to him, they can talk to his agent and he'll, he'll tell you the same thing. He's done. Just go watch his film, like you say. If you're not going to trade up for him, you're not going to get anywhere near him. So what's it matter? 
Exactly. And like his worst case scenario, he's going to be the first non QB off the board, likely. So, what's his worst case scenario? Someone comes up to four to get a quarterback, and he, instead of going to four, he goes at five. Yeah, exactly. That, exactly. That, that, yeah. So, the Chargers, just... the Chargers just got rid of Mike Williams. Like I say, if the Chargers sit there at five, do they take a tackle or do they take Marin Harrison Jr.? Like I say, it's uh, whichever one they don't take. The Giants take if they say a six and don't take quarterback. Like it, exactly, it's simple maths. Like I say, he's not getting past the Giants either way. No, it just depends who moves up, and it, but there'll be a few yeah. teams there. So yeah, who, who who cares in regards to that? But yeah, so can't go any higher. He no. can't jump. No, he's not getting past Jaden Daniels. He's not getting past Caleb Williams, and he may not get past Drake May. There's no way he can crack the top three. So even if he ran like a four three. It, it won't change anything, would it? No. They, they don't they don't need a receiver. No. They need a quarterback. And you've seen his college tape, like it's terrifying. <laughs> I just really don't want him in the NFC North. So, you know, I, I have I have nothing against him whatsoever for not doing he told everybody, everybody still acted shocked, but hey ho, right, let's move it on anyhow to the to the main focus of our evening. So like we said, we've watched these guys for years in college, the off season has come, we've seen the All-Star Games, we've seen the Combine, we've seen the Pro Days for most, etc. And this is at the point now, generally, where your boards, if you're an analyst like us who likes to do stuff like this, you generally kind of set on your guys, you've kind of got your lists ready, and, and this is at the point now where you can sort of say, with a modicum of satisfaction, these are the guys now. So what we've done is we've created our top five lists for each position, our favourite players, so please don't shout at us if, you know, we're not putting Caleb Williams at the top of the quarterback rankings, etc. These are guys who are favourites to us specifically, maybe in terms of where the Detroit Lions are drafting, or we just like them. So this is what it's all about. So, of course, we're going to start as Wills, but we'll work our way through the offence, down to the defence, and yeah, we're just going to let you know on them, five. we're going to let you know a little bit why we like these guys, and then compare notes so let's start with the quarterbacks now i know in my case like I've, I've i've not looked at any of the top quarterbacks really not in terms of a watching tape thing only what i've seen in college because let's face it detroit is not going early on there so a lot of the guys on my list here are later round guys who might interest us etc i don't know how ryan's done this he's done it his way but let's have your list rise so coming out of all this is said and done who now makes your list for quarterbacks going into the draft? For me, I've kind of like tried to do, I, I've gone for best of the position, who I think they are. So for me, well, everyone's going to get upset through it because shock, Caleb Williams is not my number one. My quarterback, my, my quarterback, it's Jaden Daniels. And I know a lot of people don't like him because he takes a lot of contact and don't protect himself. And yes, that will, that will be his downfall. But what he can do with his legs, what he can do throwing on the run, what he can do evading pressure, and when he gets up to full speed, the guy is a wizard, a magician. And I've seen him on anyone as an Arizona State fan because I saw what he did in his freshman year, his best year at Arizona State, where he came in and was a star. And it all went downhill there. But yeah, this year he did everything he could. Like I say, he took big hits. He got back up. He shook it off. Yeah, he needs to gain a bit of weight. The six foot four frame. Is built like a McCain's oven chip. Like I said, it's going to be an issue, but it don't mean it can't put weight on. So for me, what I look in the modern game of a Jules Wright quarterback, he's untouchable. So two, Caleb Williams, probably the most pro ready. Well, well, Rocky built me like thick, all throws in the book. Like I say, he's comfortable with the end line. He can come, he can command an offense, he can go through all his reads. And yeah, when he escapes, like if he wants to scamper, he's well inclined to do so. I say he's no slouch, certainly. He's athletic, very gifted. And I am firmly believe he will go number one overall. I think that's a good way. The third quarter, I, I toil with this one. And I think it's JJ McCarthy, not Drake May. And I say that as McCarthy is the pure pocket passer that can pass in rhythm on time. Good arm, makes good reads, makes very few mistakes, whatever guys do. 
Victor's very few turnovers. He doesn't put the ball in harm's way. Now, when he's flushed out or if he does get panicked or anything at the next level, I'm not sure what will happen if you have to scramble. I say, well, built, but I think the rushing or the escape prowess may let him down. So four, I've got Drake May. He will be thrust into a starting role, which is fair enough. Like I say, his body at work at UNC has warranted that. Like I say, he's been very good. He's commanded a strong offence. He was only ever let down by defence. Can do everything that's asked of him. He will turn the ball over. Like I say, there are, there are games where he's kind of gone off the boil a bit. Throwing some interceptions. He has cost them the odd game, like say, throwing, forcing a throw into a window one there, but can also make massive throws. Like I say, can hit guys deep and in stride and can cycle and go off piece. So, yeah, those guys, those four guys are, I think, all going to be end of day one starts wherever they go. Rounding out, I have Pennix Jr. Older injuries, but the velocity, the cannon. The arm, like the the throws he can make off the back foot, or when he's like flustered or out of the pocket. Some of those other guys can't make him. Like I say, he has been around the block a lot of times. The guy's a winner. Like I said, the guy got to Washington, took them to a national title, absolutely dominated this year. Yeah, there was some sloppy mistakes like the Oregon game, some poor turnovers. He's old, he's got an injury history. He's got a lot of things that work against him. But for a guy that may not even go in the first rounder, like I say, if you've got a guy that just sitting behind and maybe in a year take over, he could be a revelation for an offense. So, yeah, he's the kind of team that, like I say, and then Oral would mention, I said, Bonix. Yeah, he's good at everything. I don't think he's excellent at everything. He's a jack of all trades, master of none. I think he might still go in the first, but. I just don't think he can go. He can't go anywhere that needs a starter. Like I say, I saw someone say, like, the Rams like, sitting behind Stafford for a year. Honestly, I can see it. Makes a lot of sense. So, something like that, yeah. That would be a good guy for him to learn behind. Commands a strong offense in pockets. Yeah. Those are my quarterbacks. So, this is actually quite interesting. So, Ryan's done his top five in terms of the, all the way through the thing. I've done my top five in what pertains to. The Lions, I think if, if the Lions are going to go quarterback, it's going to be a day three one this year. It's a sort of a quarterback three to flesh out the roster. So I've sort of graded the guys who are going to be there who might fit with us. So number five, and I had to think about this a lot, but Keaton Slovis is in there. We've seen what young Keaton Slovis is like. We, we acknowledge, you know, freshman Keaton Slovis was really good in terms of his mental toughness, the ability as a pocket passer. It was really there, and it looked like he was going to be the next big thing, but it's just kind of not transpired in his career, and maybe it's bad fits of team, not protected enough, taken a lot of sacks in his career, but just maybe, just maybe there is something still there potentially to be tapped on a practice squad as a quarterback three, but, you know, wouldn't be you know, two against it if it was done quite late on. Might be an undrafted free agent. Who knows? But still, he would be up there. Number four, of course, I'm going to have my former NC State favourite, Devin Leary, on there. This is kind of similar. Devin, really good career with us with the Wolfpack. Again, as a stand and deliver pocket passer, really like what he's about. Again, the toughness, his play style, he will run, grab hard yards. I like how he can hit three levels of the field. And I think he's going to get drafted. I think he's going to get drafted day three. Um, and if it's going to be us, then he'd be on the list there to do so. But yeah, Devin Lear is there at four. Three, got the HBCU wildcard. I know he's injured, but Davius Richard is on there simply because the style of quarterback is something we've required for a long time. He's a true drool threat who's got an underrated arm. He's He got injured in the legacy bowl, unfortunately, but... Again, this is going to be a guy you're going to be able to put on your scout teams, who you're going to be able to prepare against, who's going to give you something a little bit different, kind of maybe like Hendon Hooker will next year, but with his legs, he's a little bit better. So I would be quite happy to have him on there. Then the two at the top, the two who I'd actually really be intrigued on having here. So second is Carter Bradley. Now, Carter Bradley is getting a lot of late hype for this draft. Now, he is your prototypical pocket passer and he can hit downfield and he can hit deep anyone who watches that south alabama jaguars team 
will know his ability to throw deep down the field. And as a project guy, he's a little older, but he knows the NFL very well. Dad is Gus Bradley, you know, got all the experience in there that he needs. I think he's a perfect little guy to stash away and develop and will at least create into a high level, you know, backup during his career there. And again, you're not going to have to spend more than a day three pick on him. You might get him undrafted. So he'd be up there. And But then, of course, the first one, I've mentioned him a lot. And this is very interesting, right, because he's got a top 30 visit somewhere. John Rice Plumley, UCF. Seattle, yeah. Seattle Seahawks. And because it's rare, isn't it? He didn't get a combine invite. Non-combine invitees don't get top 30 requests to go and play there because generally they're so far off the board. You don't waste the top 30 on an undrafted free agent prospect. But people are taking notice. And again, just the very shifty nature of his dual threat ability, his legs, what he can do with them and what he can do with his arm just make him so unpredictable that you can mesh a really nice level offense around him. Very specific, very dangerous, and again, gives you something that you just don't have at this moment in time. And I don't know, I'm just so intrigued by him. So Plumley is at the top of the guys I would want for the Lions there. I don't know whether they would. I think he's going to be drafted a lot higher than maybe people think at this point, but he certainly would be my level of interest on there. So those are my top five as pertains to the Lions at quarterback. Right, let us move on. To the running backs. I'll hand this one over to you again. Right, who's on your top five list of running backs who you like going into the draft? So, <clears throat> just scraping top five. I have Bucky Irving. So, I've got the Oregon back. I'd say Oregon's been a quite a, a pass heavy offense the last few years, but it doesn't mean it's not been really important. Let's like, say we've seen former guys like CJ Vidal who are worth their weight in gold in that Ducks offence. So Bucky Irving, I'd say he has carried the load where he's needed at times this year, measured in quite well. Like I say, I think he's about 5'10", I'd say just over 200 pounds. So he he's well built. Like you say, he's a good role player. Like I say, he can block and he understands the niche of being in a fairly passive hobby, pass-heavy offence, but he does able to take the pressure off a quarterback when needs be. He can take the carries when he needs to. He is good inside, he's good out. He can catch the ball at the backfield. And he's someone I think that will be a good rotational piece in a, a running back committee at the next level. I think Bucky Irving could be a nice piece to add to someone. Number four, I've got Ray Davis from Kentucky. Now, mm-hmm. like I say we saw Chris Rodriguez leave Kentucky. And then we say we get they got a new quarterback as well. And there was a big hole in the Wildcats' this offense, like big question mark at the start of this season. But Ray did a really good job. That is it. He's one of the stockier guys. He's a bit tougher. He's a bit stronger running in between the tackles. Had a really good year. He he combined with pretty well as well. Like you see, he tested pretty well all around. So I think he's someone that could surprise a few people with how highly he's picked up to be maybe more of a, a change of pace or a bell cow a bit slower, a bit stronger, a bit stockier at the next level. And number three, I've got the the monster himself, Jonathan Brooks out of Texas. He's just built like Adonis. Like you say, he is just a bruiser. He's just, he's pure muscle, strength, size, but also he's fast. He can catch. He can block. There's not a lot that Brooks can't do. And sat behind Roshan Johnson and B. Sean Robinson for a long time. Like that, That's difficult. But yeah, he was a massive part of this year. When he got hurt later down the line, we thought that that could have been Texas this year over. I'd say that, that 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 was a massive part of their offense because he was on for a potential like Big Ten Offensive Player of the Year award. He could have gone with like Amari and Hamper. He could have really gone against, I'd like, say, the Oklahoma State running back. But I think Brooks will be the perfect mold for someone to sit, put a bit of time and effort into the next level, and you may well get the bass back out of this class. Number two, so I've got the little muscle shark himself. I've got Blake Corum. Like I say. Doesn't stand any higher than, like, say, the size of a, a red letter box. Only five foot nine, but he's a freak. The bench press, God, it was like he had a vendetta against the bar. I'd say he, he just hit it. I'd say he was, he's compact. He's like a coiled spring. I'd say, what was it, like 29 rushing touchdowns the last two years or something crazy? Like, 
whether it's been the fact that he's been in just the perfect offense at the perfect time and anyone could have done it, or it's all Blake Corrin being a star, we'll never know. But right now, I've got to say that Blake Corrin who tested incredibly well despite that short stature. Like I say he could be one of the first backs taken off the board and someone could eye him as a future star in the NFL. He's done everything right. He's done everything by the book. And yeah, this off-season last year could not have gone any better for him. He's entering the draft at right the best moment and could be a solid day two option. And at the top, I have Trey Benson. And that's because, for me, he's most overall, well-rounded, the complete back. Crazy speed, the 40, which, for me, for a running back, it matters. He's got the next gear that some guys don't have. Did he measure him well? Yep, he's on a six foot. I say, is he well over 200 pounds? Basically, he looks like he was built on a, a Ford like car plant line, like they just got him off a conveyor belt. And he has been crucial to what the Seminoles have been doing the last couple of years. Like I say, he has proved that he can take the workload, he can have the home run ability to take it to the house, or he can get down and dirty and physical in the trenches when needs to be. And for me, he's just. I don't think it's a great year for running backs, but I think if you're going to go with an option, you want Trey or Blake. But they will cost you. you put, you're going to have to spend a second-round pick probably on Trey Benson. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but you're getting the upper echelons of better back in the class, potentially. Interesting. What number do you think the top running back will go at? Like, roughly. You say second, but with it like... Cause it's intriguing with a running back class. Like Brooks might have been a fringe first if he'd stayed healthy, but... I think the first back will be off the board by like 50, 55. Yeah. I, th- I think it'll be of... years that would have been like three or four off the board. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah I think that's found over territory. I just don't see anyone coming in the top 40 to 45. It's just other positions are just too deep. They're going to be an afterthought, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. They are. A like, ton of corners, ton of tackles. Who knows? Right, so that's Ryan's top five there. So again, so with me, I've done my top five on fit for the Lions and where we're going to be at. We, we kind of need a day three running back if we're going to have one. So I've listed some of my favourites in terms of day three guys who you might be able to get. So at number five, we've got the enigma, Tyrone Tracy Jr. from Purdue. Now, he's had... 142 carries, 146 carries in his collegiate career. He's one of those. The body of work is just not there. He's got the one year this year. So he's not got the tread. He's not had the bumps. He's not had the knocks, et cetera. So what are you getting with him? And so seeing him in this offseason, in the All-Star games, every time he got the ball, he pushed the pile forward. Like, he's just this relentless running back who will go out and get you good yardage every time he touches the ball. And I was really impressed with him and what I saw there. And again, because you don't have that mileage on the clock, it's like, if you only need a running back three, you can kind of bring a guy like that in and take a little bit of a swing on him and see what you're going to get. Because potentially you could get a lot of usage given that he's not had that workload in college ball. On the flip side, just one year of production. Is he going to be able to do it all? Not sure, but call McCullough me intrigued on that one. Number four, I've got Blake Watson from Memphis. I've been high on him for a very long time now. The old Dominion, the former old Dominion running back who's been at Memphis in his last year. The two back-to-back 1,000-yard seasons at 800 before that. Does it in the group of five at one of the lowest schools there in Old Dominion. Works his ass off, plays really well, gets the move up to Memphis, has his best year out of them all on a really good team. And kind of what has elevated him right up there for me and my likes is in the offseason. What you've seen is his ability as a receiver. He has got some really, really good hands and he has a real good catch radius about him. So he's a dual threat guy. And another one who's just really not had the limelight put on him, I think in terms of a three for us, he would be absolutely perfect because I think he could come in and take a load if one of the top two guys goes down. And again, you can use him in both facets of the game. So I value that very much highly there. Then we're going to a couple of the bruisers because we do already have a couple of versatile backs on our team and we maybe need a bruiser at number three to be able to come in and take that load off them. So number three, I've got Frank Gore Jr. I've just been more and more impressed by he's ran for like over 4,000 yards in college. He is, you know, the, you know, he is the name 
the son of one of the best running backs of all time. But I think he, in his own right, is going to have a very good NFL career. He's a little bit shorter. So was his dad. He's got speed, which people did not expect. Again, you saw it in the pro, you saw it in the All Star Game circuit. The guy's got speed, and people don't think he has that. But he's got speed. He's got strength. He's got everything you want, and he's got the pedigree as well. So I'd be really interested in him. Uh, number two, Kamani Vidal of Troy. Again, I won't be a Troy player on this team. In terms of all the running backs in the class, he's the best pass protector. If you want to bring a guy in on third down to come in and protect your quarterback, this is the guy you go out and get. But at the same time, he is also the guy that you can bring in and turn to if you're Sean and in an emergency and need someone to take 15 to 20 carries and do really well. He's your guy. And again, he's coming from a system where they just kick your ass. Like we do in Detroit, they run you over, they stop the run, they do all the nitty-gritty, dirty things that you need. So, Kamani Vidal, I would really like him here if we're going to draft the third running back. And there's only one guy I'd go in front of him for, and everyone knows who this will be, because people know my love for Missouri, Cody Schrader. Really love Cody Schrader. I think he's going to be a great NFL running back. The Division II superstar who then walked on at Missouri and won their starting job in year one. Again, this guy's just to do it all back. He's great as a receiver, but as a running back, he's one of the most intelligent guys in this draft when it comes to finding the holes, exploiting it, getting those extra yards. Again, I think he's a perfectly complimentary running back three for this team. So... Schrader would be the guy I would love there. So get him at day three as well. So those are my five when it comes to the running backs in terms of who I like for the Lions. Let us move it on and we will go to wide receiver. So Ryan, your top five wide receivers. Uh, Honourable mention is Brian Thomas Jr. The second fiddle at LSU. I'd say that was kind of like an afterthought. But he's explosive. He's got a good frame. He's got a good range. And I think someone will reach for him at the end of the first round. Whether or not that's a reach, we'll find out. But I think he will do. So coming at number five, uh, a, lie, a player I've seen a lot of people think maybe could be a lion, Adonai Mitchell of Texas. Like I say, very, very impressive workout. Very impressive offseason. The combine, the stats, the figures, you look at everywhere, which about it. The guy's an athlete. He's explosive. The measurables are good. And he has got the tape to back it up as well. He's a punt on softs. I say he's got the ability to take the roof off the defense. Whether or not we already have him in Jameson Mitchell, I don't know. I feel like it, if we took him, it'd be a bad sign for Jameson. I feel like any receiver the Lions draft this year, it, it casts doubt over Jameson. So I, I'm not. I'm not on the receiver train, but I can see it. At four, we've already mentioned him, I have Lad McConkey. And I know he's not the sexy pick for some people. I know he's not that flashy. I know the stats don't back it up, and I know he's not a six-foot-four Greek god. I ain't saying he's built average, but athletically he's good. But I say as a role player, as a guy that could come in and potentially become or take over the job of a number one, become a quarterback's favourite target, I could kind of see it. I know some people won't expect it, but yeah, he's got all the attributes of the hard worker that will stay before first in, last out, and will do everything he can to justify that pick. And he's another guy that he he will go higher than some people want to believe he will do. Someone's probably already fallen in love with him. He looks like a New England player. Could be a New England Patriot. We know they've got an affinity with their, uh, their white assassin receivers. But yeah, I think he'll do pretty well. So at three, it's not it, it's it. I've got Roma Dunze. He's big, he's very big, he's strong. And of all the guys here, he's the best in contested catches. You want a guy that's a possession based receiver that can out muscle a guy in the end zone at wide scrimmage? He's doing that better than anyone else I've already mentioned. Like you say, he has got a nasty streak, he has got body control, and he's got hands like glue. And he might not have early top end speed, but honestly, that don't matter. I say he's going to be a great player at the next level. At number two, I have Malik Neighbors. So the LSU star, it's kind of all happened very quickly for him. This this, this rise to ascendancy, 
and people are talking about it in the same breath as MHJ. But yeah, I think the kid probably will be an absolute star. He's got the things you can't teach. Cuts on a dime. Great speed. Hands like glue. And plays with a swagger as well, like you say. He's the, he he was a he was a wide receiver one in every aspect of the word. And he will be the kind of guy that can come in and instantly will be a favourite for offensive rookie of the year. I could see a very heavy workload. And uh, number one, I think realistically, it's you don't need any mention like it, it's MHJ and it is it's Marvin Harrison Jr. Like the body of work has has spoke for itself and he's had not had to do anything else in the offseason. And yeah, he will be gone within the first few picks of the draft. And whoever gets him is getting probably the most pro ready guy, one of the most pro ready guys in the draft. I say he will come out there and instantly command respect from defence. He won't have to earn it. They know what he can do. On the right team, that is. I'd hate to see him wasted on a team that's not got their shit to get around offence or a quarterback that just doesn't have a good arm and can't get downfield. Don't waste him yet. It, it's a very top pair. Let's say this wide receiver class could be some very, very good. Yeah, I agree with you there. Like MHJ is just so far ahead of everyone else at this point. Um, he's going to be great. Just please, please don't come to the NFC North, MHJ. Um, right, moving on to my list. So again, I'm doing this based on my guys alike for the Lions. So it's going to be completely different here. So. I've got a wide variety, of guys, because I do think the Lions could benefit from a couple of different types of receivers. So number five, and I've really been won over him, won over on him during this offseason because it's time we had a guy like this. I've got Anthony Gould, the Oregon State wide receiver. He is the return extraordinaire. They use him at running back. You use him on the outside. I'm not going to make the lazy comparison, but he's a do-it-all gadget receiver who I feel could really flourish in our system and gives us that returnability with a guy. You know, we've had some decent returners with us, but since Jamal Agnew left, he could be the next iteration of Jamal Agnew, but better. And we really like that guy like that in our offense. So Gould has won me over in that regard. He's at number five. Number four, I've got the Yak Master himself. Again, long been an admirer. Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky. I'd say two years ago, nearly a thousand yards of yak playing for Westing until he gets the ball, he gets yardage after whether he bulldozes you over, whether he uses his crisp routes to get separation. This is a man who is a big playmaker at the next level. And every team could do with that, no matter how stacked you are. You need a guy who can work the slot, he can work the outside as well. So you've got positional versatility to work with the guys we've already got here. You've got a target who you can get the ball too quick, who can make things happen afterwards. And given for me, wide receiver is a day three priority this year. I'm really predominantly looking at guys who are going to be in that category. So I think Malachi Corley, he could go day two, to be fair. He might do. I might get that one wrong, but I think he would be great in this team. And then my top three... So I've got outside receivers of varying natures because, you know, you can have a little bit of everything in this draft. So the first one, number three, I've got is Ryan Flournoy, the Southeast Missouri State Red Hawk, who again had a great combine, posted a 4-4 in his 40, but he has been a very productive outside receiver. He's built like a brick house, as they say. And this is the guy who... you definitely going to bring him in as a developmental option on the outside but he looks every bit like an NFL receiver he's going to go the route of Andre Yoshivas he's settling in at the Browns if you're looking for a guy to develop on the outside he's there for me at number three number two now people who know me might scoff about this a little bit because I've poured scorn on him but I've actually got Xavier Legetta as my number two for the Lions if you're going to go big on a receiver he would be the kind you want. Now, I, I don't want anything to do with him at 29. I don't buy this first-round talk whatsoever. He's not a first-round guy, not even close. He's got one year of production. He's underdeveloped as an outside wide receiver because he's just not been utilized properly. But he got his big year. He's good on the outside, but you're going to need time for him to develop. You pick a round two pick on him, great. He's exactly what we need. Big physical presence on the outside to complement the other two guys. And I think with the right development... We've seen what Randall L does with our wide receivers. He's going to be really, really good. 
but you don't spend 29 on him now. But I would like him if we're going to go big on a receiver. He is the guy I would like to go big on. And then, of course, number one, <laughs> absolutely no surprise whatsoever. Joshua Cephas out of UTSA. And I will just scream this from the rafters as I always have done. Lions like receivers who get down and dirty and do everything required to earn the right to have the ball thrown at them. He is that guy. You watch the UTSA Roadrunners team, the wide receivers have to block. He's really good at blocking. You saw it during the Shrine Bowl, I think it was that. He was the one who sprung Frank Gore Jr. for his big touchdown run. Terrific piece of blocking on the outside to get him gone for a 52-yard touchdown. He does everything you need. He's been a superstar on that team, and yet he not found it beneath him to go in there in the trenches to battle for his buddies, to create work for them. And as an outside receiver, he's strong, he's tough, he is physical, he's everything you want him to be at this level. The Lions, it's no block, no rock. This man blocks, he's going to get the rock, and he's going to do a lot at the next level. I really, really want Joshua Cephas in a Lions uniform come the end of this draft. So, of course, he was going to be my number one guy when it pertains to the Lions. Right, let's move it on. we got tight ends, and... It is a barren class, so we might have a few spillovers here, right? But moving it on to you, who's in your top five for tight ends? Yeah, this one easy, because to be honest, I don't have five guys. Like I said, I had, I had four. So coming in at four, I've got Jaheim Bell as a Lawrence State guy. Undersized, underutilized, but tested fairly well. As a pure receiver, someone might find a hole for him, might find a way to slip him in, maybe even use him as a bit of a receiver at the next level. I feel like he offers. He's got he's got some speed, he's got some okay size, he's got hands. I say blocking will be where he'd have to work his genuine game before he's more snaps. I say, but I think if you're gonna take him primarily as a receiver, something you can do there as a high end three or four. And for Darren Holker, now, as you mentioned, let's say, kind of been a star this year. He does the dirty work. Go back in and watch his highlights on YouTube, the contested catches. Like you say, if the ball is up there and it's the odds are greater than 50 50, he's going to go get it. Like you say, he's, he's strong, he's physical, he's got a good frame. And yeah, he do not create much separation, but he trusts and relies on his skills and ability to go out there and win a ball that is, by NFL standards, catchable. He won't often be our muscled. And in the red zone, had a great year, set some Colorado State records. He just finds a knack for being open. Chris Brown running, and yeah, he's a bully at the line of scrimmage. And he's just really hard to deal with because he's physical, he's clever, he knows how to use his body, and he's able to go up and get the ball. And honestly, that, that is enough to get on a 53 these days. If you don't do anything between 20s, but he can be reliable there in the end zone, then he's going to make some money. He's going to catch some touchdowns. And I think I'd like to see him do really well in that aspect. If he's there late day two, early day three, why not Detroit? Like I say, we brought back Brock Wright, but it wasn't a cheap tender. So there are options there for a tight end of the future. So at three, I've got Jatavian Sanders. Strong. He's a well he's a he's a well rounder. I don't think he's brilliant at anything, but I think he tested fairly well. I think he's got a good frame. Can block, will block, can catch. I say you're not gonna have to spend much capital on him, but he could have quite a surprising upside in the right offense. As as a depth guy, as a rotational piece. And the top two guys. For me, people think it's really far, but for me, it's straight up 1A, 1B. 1A, do you want a pure receiver that's going to go out and probably terrorise the NFL next year? You take Brock Bowers. But for that, you're probably going to need a top 15 draft pick. Or do you want a guy that can be a lead blocker, a full back, a H-back that can just move around like a chess piece, but can also catch the ball and play really well? But he's not as, not athletic, not as athletic, not as fast or explosive, then you take 1B, you take Ben Sinner. But you get him on day two. Like I say, that can do most things that Brock can do. And he's probably a more accomplished blocker right away. I think that I, I think some people will prefer Ben's skill set. But 
they won't say that or they'll be too scared to say that because everyone knows Brock Bowers is like going to be a star here. It's different, different girls, different girls. So yeah, that, that's my tight end rankings. But I, if Ben Sinner in five years had a better career than Brock Bowers, I would not be surprised because someone just utilised him better and Brock just... We've seen Kyle Pitts fizzle out. Could the same thing happen to Brock Bowers? Well, yeah, it could, technically speaking, if you don't fall in the right offence or they don't get in the ball. I'll tell you exactly when he'll fizzle out, when I pick him for my fantasy football team, just like Kyle Pitts did. They always, <laughs> the tight ends and always as well. play him out. Brock yes. Bowers will have to learn to protect himself because yeah. out there, a guy's going to be out there head on him. Straight yeah. Away. Yeah, what one hundred percent agreed there. So in terms of my Titans, I agree. Like you know, Bowers is by far and away the best tight end prospect in this class. I just don't see us having any particular need to get him. So I've not got him on here. But again, like I said, Benson is a day two pick. We'll go through that. So my top five, number five, just because his ceiling is potential top ten tight end in the NFL, like really good. His floor is playing in the CFL in one year's time. And that's Brevin Spanford. Like, I'm so, so torn on him. The Minnesota tight end. Like, you saw a little bit of the receiving, what he can do in the All-Star game. He's got about seven touchdowns in his collegiate career. It's not anything to, you know, where I'm, you know, right home about, but he's a massive man. And like that Minnesota team runs the ball a lot. He has to do a lot of dirty work on that line. And he's not really been utilized as a receiver as much. So it's how high is the ceiling and does the blocking carry on at this level? Because he's big. If guys can get under him and start levering him around, he's going to have issues. The taller guys have more trouble to deal with in that regard. So it's just because his ceiling is so ceiling and floor are so far apart, I can't put him any higher than that. But Spamford is certainly a curiosity. Would I be unhappy to see him with us? No, because again, we can kind of have a tight end three and you can work them in. It's it's a situation where we're not desperately in need now. So yes, Bamford's there at five. Number four is Isaac Rex. So he's the BYU captain. He is all round tough nuts. He is, you know, you know what you get from BYU. Again, you've got to be very physical with blocking. You've got to be willing to do a lot of run blocking there because they love to run the football and he's an all round he's a captain on there i know he will take a leadership role right away on any team that he goes to and he's also very good as a receiver again not utilized as much because puka was eating all his targets up until last year and then there was no jaron hall that team's not been as good this year but still had a relatively good season so isaac rex is there at number four for me three is dallin holker i agree with ryan he's He's going to be really good. I think he's going to, someone's going to draft him higher than maybe they're expecting. But like, he's just an ultimate hard ass. And some of the catches he made in this offseason were just unreal. Like, the dude has, I think, sneakily good hands. He's another who could be a top 10 tight end in the NFL sooner rather than later. Number two, in terms of if you want a really good blocking tight end alone, which kind of we need, I've got McCallan Castles from Tennessee been on my radar a little bit he is really good when it comes to blocking and in Tennessee that spread offense you got to do a lot of blocking on the perimeter you got to get out wide but it's a very you know taxing offense if you're a blocker and he's really good at it so if you want a guy who's just going to pure out block for you he's the guy there and then number one I got Ben Sinner I can't really have much more to what Rice said there he's for me he's the best all-rounder as a receiver and a blocker right now if you tally them both together out of everybody apart from Brock Bowers, who's just stupidly good. He's that guy. So, like, it would be a luxury pick maybe for us because he's going to go day two, but I'd be very interested indeed. Right. Let's get to the offensive line. And, I mean, tackles, a lot of them around this year. Let's start on the outside, right? You have top five offensive tackles in the draft. So, in at five... <clears throat> So I've gone here primarily tackles that could be sent as and I've got guards that could also be sent as that. That's how I've divided them. So tackles. I've got JC Latham at five. Experienced. Why well, say a winner? Good build, solid base, good hands, gets the job done. Why well, say equally, like I say, just as good in run as Aaron Pass Pro. And 
I don't know, like I say, he may not start straight away, but could earn a starting job pretty quickly. Like I say, he, he, he's strong, and I think he's one of the safest options on the list. At four, see, I've got a Marius Mims. Now, like the guy's built like the Burj Khalifa, right? I think he's the biggest in the draft. Is, is, is he six foot eight? Yeah. Like Marius Mims. He, he is an absolute freak. Like you say, he's young. Like you say, played good amount of college football. Sometimes starting, like you say, he feels like he's not had as much experience as he could. He could be the next big thing, I like say, physically and actually talent wise. I feel like, though, they're going to be some growing pains for him. And usually with big, big, big men, they usually have some growing pains. Like you say, it's. It's usually the footwork, it's usually the bottom half where they struggle. Like I say, he, he could be the kind of guy that in a year takes over and becomes a mauler, but you see a lot of, you can see penalties in the rookie year. I can see him drafted being a starter and you take the good with the bad, but I feel like he will definitely come good. Three, no more set, all the fashion. You. Whether it's a tackle or it's a centre, I don't know, teams will want him for different things, but Penn State, Stalwart, I say, fantastic in run offense because Penn State just just they just love to run the ball, and guys behind him have run down that middle for years, and he has just carved away for them. I say, leader, captain, and just very well trusted, very well respected, and will be a very good starter. He's a plug and play guy, a guy going in the first round. Number two, Tulisi Fuaga, Morgan State, a natural. Yeah, a pure tackle for me. Like I say, part of a very surprising outfit in the last few years for the Beavers. They have been really good to watch and they've been they've caused quite a few upsets. And he, the guy just seems like he's got a nasty streak through him. I kind of love that. I kind of love him for Detroit, but he could be long gone before we're even on the clock. I say for our guy, he is viewed as one of the guys that could be the next dying tackle for someone like the Jets. I say that they're well out of our range, so I feel like he's a he's also another plug and play that should have a very solid rookie year. Not heavily penalised, big frame, strong base, and then number one. Honestly, this this guy I think he's head and shoulders above the rest. Joe Alt, I say, I think he'd be wasted at centre because you just look at the guy's a skyscraper. The guy's got long arms, a big frame a wide base, and he has nullified most that have come up against him for most of his time in college. He has very rarely ever had egg on his face. And, yeah, he's probably, I think he's the first guy off the bar that's not quarterback or not called Marvin Harrison Jr. I feel like the charges are the Giants. you just got a game, right? You say he, he's not generational, I don't think, but he's also by far the clear, best clearing day starter if you need a tackle, because it's so hard to play a tackle as a rookie in the NFL. Everything's faster, but for me, I feel like Joe will take to it from a, like a duck to war, if I'm honest. I feel like there'll be very few growing pains as a rookie. And yeah, you're going to get the best long-term potential player, but yeah, he will cost a heavy draft pick, but he's well worth the price. And you're coming from a system that just bleeds out NFL offensive no, linemen. Like their, their offensive line, they just known for it. Yeah, like if you, if you want like a product guarantee almost, if you're coming from a good school, like then then you've got it. That's what it's one of the best lineages you can get for offensive linemen. Just very quickly, I was doing my mock draft yesterday. And is it not a stretch to say Fuaga could go second tackle now? Like I know he's just a right tackle, but I just he's so damn good. Like I have him mocked to wherever the Chargers go right now. Like they need a right tackle, and it's McCarthy. You know, Harbaugh's there now. Loves to run the football. But I don't know if he gets if the Chargers stay at five. Hot take: I think he could go before all because they don't need a left tackle because they got Slayer. I don't I think know. People used to look down on right tackle. Like say, like it wasn't anywhere near as important left tackle. I mean, that's just not true anymore. <laughs> that, like you have got to have two elite tackles. It don't matter what side they block, the blind side or not. It, it It's just not important. Like I said, the Lions, that's the reason the Lions didn't move Sewell to left mm. tackle. They could have done. Could have moved to deck at right tackle, but he said, no, we'll leave him because right tackle is just as important. Yeah, 
and he's a mauler. So yeah, I I reckon yeah he's going to be a like I said to charge just move back three or four spots, eleven or twelve. That's uh, yeah, I can see Fwag going there. Yeah, I you know I genuinely can see him like having a shot of being second tackle for certain. He again depending on scheme, I think he could challenge for first. I just think he's that damn good. If we needed a tackle this year, I'd be like, go up, get him, do what you can. Um, right. So in terms of my tackles, again, I'm basing it on who I like for the Lions, not who's the best in the draft. And again, sort of day three picks really going into this year. We need draft and developmental talents for the offensive line. So the five guys I've got here, sort of a variation. So number five, I've got the the maniac mullet, Frank Crum from Wyoming. Dude is massive. He's 6'8", 320 pounds. And you saw at the combine, the dude ain't a slouch. He ran a really quick 40. He is athletic as they come. He is experienced. He spent the last four years starting as Wyoming's left tackle. And if you want to draft a guy who you can sit and develop long-term to play at those tackle spots, he's right up there. I love him. And he's a great guy to boot as well. It's great to listen to his interviews and stuff. But... He would be he would fit the sort of system we have here. And again, you can sit him a bit and you can get him ready. But I've been really impressed with him and how he's gone about this offseason, how he's smashed the combine, how he's done all that. Sort of just filled out the numbers a little bit. He's got good good, good collegiate record, but he's athletic as well, which will help him at the next level. Number four, another combine snub who's been performing really well and is beginning to look. He's a developmental swing tackle, so you can play him either side. Travis Glover from Georgia State, and he has been getting his, his pro day was a few days ago. And I know they were going crazy again, how well athletically he tested for such a big guy. But he can play on both sides of the line, very, very versatile when it comes to our plays. And, and we do need a swing tackle. We have lacked a swing tackle since Terrell Crosby retired. And it is about time we could get out and get there a guy who can do both. Again, in the long term, it's going to take time. But stay in the group of five, but he's got all the attributes you want in your offensive lineman if you're going to develop them. So he's there at four. Number three, I'll go down to the FCS, Garrett Greenfield. You'll know him very well, the South Dakota State guy. He's, again, another swing tackle. He's played both tackle positions for the Jack Rabbits, and you know that team loves to run the football. They love to get all their motion going. You know, they you know, they pull these guys. They ask a lot of them athletically. Again, we want these guys who can just get all over the field to help this run game go. And he's certainly in that regard. So I really like him. So Garrett Greenfield's there at three. And then at two, I've got Javon Foster. He's the massive tackle from Missouri. This is the guy who's been playing the blind side for Brady Cook, keeping him very much upright the last couple of seasons, and has also helped Cody Schrader be one of the best running backs in college football. When they run the ball, they run behind him. He is the leader on that offensive line. He's got big experience in the Power Five, and he's completely getting overlooked in this tackle class. You're probably going to get him on day three. And as like prospects go, he's one of the best there if you're going to develop the position. And then number one, Tylen Grable from UCF. I really, really, really like this guy. So four years starter, he's had two years at Jacksonville State and then two years at UCF. And this is what I like the most. Jacksonville State, as we know, they're a run-heavy team. Like, they have been in the FCS. They have now that they've come up to the FBS. He's played in a system where, again, he's had to do a lot of run blocking. He's a very good run blocker. But then he's had, because he transferred up from the FCS to the FBS at that point, so he's still an FCS team. You go to UCF, and what a scheme change that is from what Jacksonville State do. They do still run the ball a lot, but with Rice Plumley in there, they use motion so much. They love to pass the ball as well. You've got to do a lot of pass protection. You've got to do a lot of, you know, getting out to the perimeter blocking, second level stuff, all this kind of crazy concepts that UCF run. And he took to it like a duck to water. He made the jump up and he made it look easy. So a guy who's played in a traditional run heavy system, and has played in a lot more sort of spread offensive system as well. He's got, you know, and he's proven it. He's just kept making the jump up and he still played great football. So you've shown, and this year he played in the power five. He went from FCS to FBS, but group of five and then FBS power five. So three years in a row, he's made a transition to higher level opposition 
and he's looked like a duck in water. In terms of guys who you want, if you're going to develop them, I think he's absolutely perfect for us. So day three, Tyler and Grable, I'd be all over that. Love it. Right. Let's move on to the interior. We've done the tackles. In the interior, more interesting because a lot more discussion about some of the top guys here. Who you got in your top five, Brian? So I've seen three of the guys I've listed given to the Lions. Either the 29 or later. So a lot of these guys, yeah, I think a lot of people know guard is. It's a big need for Detroit. At five, I've got Cooper Beebe from Kansas State. A natural guard, a career guard, long time. Great in the run game. He can pull as well. Like I say, he is comfortable coming across the face of the quarterback and picking up the block on the outside or sealing the edge. Experienced. Not overly flashy, but fills a need and he's done it at a school that has got better and better over the last couple of years and it's become quite a solid winning program. And he's been one of their better classes. So I feel like he's going to be a solid day two option for someone that needs an outside guard. At four... A relatively quick rise, I mean, Zach Frazier, so the West Virginia guard slash center. But yeah, he has got a bit of a nasty streak about him, a bit of a mean streak in the run game, like you say. Apparently, he's a, he's a bit of a mole that likes to get in people's faces and just, just, just drive them back. Like you say, he likes to dominate and win on the line of scrimmage and has got experience at center, which will help with some teams. Some teams won't be too bothered by it, but it does offer some versatility. As a long-term start. And the Mountaineers, a team that do like to run the ball. Like I said, they they have been really good at that in the last couple of years. And they've had quite a strong offense as well. Despite not having wins, the Mountaineers have been very fun to watch in the last few years. And he's been a key part of that. Number three. So I've got uh, it's Graham. It's Barton. Is it Barton or Burton? Oh, Graham Barton. Graham Barton. Yeah, Graham Barton from Duke. Defensive guard. Now, I've seen him mock to the Lions at 29. Whether that's realistic or not, I'll never know. But for someone that he's not flashy, I say he's not all empowering, but as a long term starter on an offensive line for me, that football has been very sound and solid in the last few years. He has been one of the more consistent guards in the power five for me. And he does fill a huge goal of what Lions need. Duke, they love to run the ball. They have sent multiple backs to the draft. And it all went through their offensive line. And it's him through their scheme. And he is someone that's experienced. He is wise. He has got a lot of snaps under his belt at the guard position. And he will be someone that we could plug and play in our system. I genuinely think as soon as we need to, whether that's someone with injury, a retire, or he just beats out a veteran, I feel like he's someone that is old enough and wise enough to win a starting job fairly quickly, and I have some people like him to Detroit. At two, I've got Jackson Powers Johnson. Like I say, he could be a better centre. Maybe the guy, maybe he's maybe, yeah, I think he's probably a starting centre. But he doesn't get enough love for Oregon last few years. Everyone's like, oh, he's Bonix, Bonix, that. But like, what about the guy that's been snapping the ball consistently? And it's been part of a very strong run offence for the time there. The guy was like a 0.921 nearly a five-star recruit out of high school, like in 2021. He's been on the radar nationally for years, and now suddenly people are just talking about him now. Like I say, he is a hulking beast of a man that can snap the ball, he can engage, he can take on double teams, he can disengage, and he can get to the next level, and he's a finisher. And I actually think if you're looking for a rookie centre, you will not find many better than Pat Johnson. And he's another one that could sneak into the first round if the right team do want him. Uh, number one, I have got Troy for, for Palmer. That's how I pronounce it, from Washington. Yeah, like, I, just, I love the guy and I really like the guy. I find it hard to see where he goes because, like I say, it's a vast market. It's the interior offensive line. Could go fairly high, could get lost in the crowd, but yeah. Washington, another offensive line factory. It feels like they, they just make these guys, like I say, they are just a great, solid unit. And this guy is just, I think it's the complete package uh, for, for a guy. He's, he's big, he's got a big base, he pass pro, he can run block, experienced. I can't, I, I've had read some of it. 
all the snaps under his belt for the Huskies over the last couple of years. And yeah, coming off great years, like I say, won a lot of games and a very well-respected leader. And yeah, for me, I actually think, and apart from maybe corner, I think interior offensive line is by far the strongest groups or classes or positions this year in the draft. And that is great for us. That's great for a lot of teams, like I say. And there are potential, like I said, there's a lot of potential starting guards that you could get in the top 100, 150 picks. And that that doesn't usually happen. No, no. There's, like I say, plenty to be had there for teams who really need it. So for me, again, so I'm doing mine Lions based. So I've got two centers, three guards, centers more draft developmental guys, guards looking potentially more towards starters. But again, you can develop them as well. So number five, I've not talked about in a little while, but I'm still really high on him. So this is for future center position. Sincere Hainsworth, the Tulane center, get a prospect who really gets overlooked. He's 6'1", 310 pounds. So he's a little undersized, you might say, for the center position. But this is a guy who has anchored a line for a very good Green Wave team. They've knocked out back-to-back 1,000-yard -back rushers, obviously, Ty J Spears, the year before last, he had over 1,500 yards on the year. Mackie Hughes this year had over 1,300 yards. This is an offensive line that runs the football incredibly well, and a lot goes through him down the center, just boring out these big holes in the line for these guys to go out and get all these yards. Love him there. And in terms of his pass protection, also really good, you know, Really strong striking of his hands, recognition of late blitzers, keeping his quarterback upright, gives up very few sacks in the collegiate game. Again, it's sort of just his size, really, that gets to him. But in terms of everything else, up here, IQ, mentally, he's got everything he needs. He reads the game very well. He understands his assignments completely. I think if you're going to stash him for a year or two while Ragnar for us is, you know, in the last few years of his career, maybe, this is the guy you prepare long-term to replace him. I, I just, I really like the guy. I think he's great. And I think he's completely underrated. At number four, the first guard. So the three guards you'd expect are on here. Exovier Gadlin. Nobody talks about him. The Liberty guard. And with reason, he's had his struggles during his collegiate career. But he's played four different positions. His right tackle, left guard, right guard, centre. He's done just about everything that's been asked of him. First at Tulsa and then at Liberty, and eventually he's settled into becoming a high-level, versatile offensive lineman. And everyone's seen what Liberty have done the last two years. Their offensive line has been one of the better ones going, as they have just ran over everybody. They ran completely through the CUSA this year. I think the versatility he gives you, the amount of spots he can play, that is what makes him really enticing for a team like us who are looking for the next generation of guys to replace the starters as and when they're gone. Um, you can see me say more about him in the Shrine Bowl preview that we had. He's just a really easy to like for, easy to root guy. And yeah, the versatility does that there for me. Number three is Bortolini. <laughs> Again, I like Hainsworth for the centre role, but if we're maybe going to go a little bit pricier for a centre of the future, Bortolini's the guy. Ryan's already said a lot about him, so I'm not really going to go much more there but just the guys tough as nails that playing that wisconsin team again they get a lot of good rushes there they run the ball a lot of rushing yards because of guys like him and the job they do and then my top two you already know who they're going to be christian mahogany out of boston college again the last two guys to come out of boston college from guard zion johnson chris lindstrom one's earning 100 million the other was a first round pick last year but Mahogany is as good as they get really at the guard position. He's been incredibly loyal to the program. He's had his injury issues, but they're long gone now. He's had some very big NIL offers to leave Boston College. He stayed there. He showed leadership as a captain. You know the Boston College guards, very technically refined, very clever again with the IQs. This is a guy who just picks up anything and everything. Very, very switched on. And he's going to be a plug and play guard to start right away for us. In long term, he'll beat out Kevin Zeitler for me, but you don't have to rush him into play straight away because there are a few little bits, but for the most part, he's a prospect who is ready to go. And the least shocking reveal of this entire thing, number one, is Christian Haynes, the Yukon guard. 
the guy I want pretty much more than anyone in this draft, maybe accepting my defensive lineman number one. Nasty, 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 and in a great way because he comes, he's undersized again, but when it comes to the run game, you're not going to find anyone nastier. One of the most athletic guards out there, very highly experienced and again shown loyalty to a program that really he could have gone on and done much bigger and better things for. And, and when a guy's that good and he stays, he leads from front. I like that. I like the loyalty that he showed to a team. But he's, he's Detroit played through and through. You want to describe a Detroit player in this draft? Haynes is the personification of that. So I really hope we get him on day two because I think that is where he is going. Right. That's the offense done. Let's switch it over, right? We'll go on to... The defensive line will do have you done DT and D edge, haven't you? You've done tackles yeah. and edges. So let's start with the D tackles. Who've you got in your top five for D tackles? See so number five, and yeah, they might upset people. I've got Darius Robinson. I know people want a homecoming. I know he's like a born and bred Lions fan. But the problem is he's a tweener. I don't think he knows what he is, and I don't think people know what he is or where best use. So, for me, he's not a first round guy. Like I say, I know he's only six six, like two forty, and his testing wasn't great. But like I say, he's got that that high more, that high energy. He's got the size, the length, the bend that people kind of desire and crave at the position. I feel like if he puts it all together in the right scheme, he could be a star at the next level. Coming off a very good year, which it, that is quite important. But yeah. For me, he's in at five. Like I say, I think he'll be the fringes of, like I say, start of day two, which won't be too bad for him. At four, got to Vondre Sweat. He's kind of slid a little bit. Like I say, he's, he's a black hole. Like I say, he will do disgusting things up the middle. Like I say, he will take on double teams. He will swallow up guys. He will stuff guys. Is he athletic enough? And can he stay light enough to be an asset? potential rushing the pass at next level remains to be seen right now for me he, he's very yeah he's heavy and he needs to be managed but uh, if you want a pure interior wrecker i say right now he's probably a guy three Braden fisk not many guys had a better con mind did they he showed across the entire board he's an athletic dude with a hard work ethic and a very high motor he might be the kind of guy that you can leave on the field for three or four downs and he doesn't have to come off and get a big gulp of oxygen out of an air canister. Like I say, he seems like he might have the motor to go every down. And like I say, in the run game can be effective. Also shown flashes in the pass rush. So he's kind of a do-it-all guy that's hopefully got the stamina to go a couple of rounds. So I think he, he came out of this whole thing really high. People are really hiring him now. He he's probably in himself a decent payday at the draft. At two, got Byron Murphy, Texas. So for me, him and Tavondre Sweat have now swapped around. I think Murphy's the leader. A lot of people say like he's kind of like a bit of like a college cancer because he's shorter, he's stockier in the middle, but I think he can be just as disruptive at the next level. I think he can still earn his respect and uh, do the dirty stuff against the run. But I'd like his chances of getting in the backfield. And he tested very well. The 40 he ran, but not just the 40, the 10-yard split was so impressive. The guy gets off the snap of the ball quicker than most guys. I see he can literally be in that back, knifing in that backfield for some people and knows the ball's even been snapped. And he's going to rely on them pure instincts. He's probably going to eat some penalties. He's probably going to get called for some false starts and neutral zone fractions, try to turn the snap. But when he gets it right, there will be a sweet spot. And I think he'd be a really good pick. And then for me, it's head and shoulders, number one. It's just on Newton. You don't be Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year and a consensus All-American and a team captain at his size, his weight, his physicality, dominating the interior of a line, and you're not the best D-line in the class. Like you say, the thoughts of him being able to free up someone like Ali McNeil or working in tandem on that interior of a defensive line, commanding, the attention of a centre and a guard, physically being over to be able to overwhelm them and be a finisher in the backfield. He could be the kind of guy that never leaves the field ever and could be very disruptive and will garner lots of respect. He's got strength in spades, but also 
he has got deceptively nippy pace if he does want to pursue after the quarterback, if he does decide to peel off. So, yeah, he is the complete package. And whether or not he falls 29, that will remain to be seen. But if he does, I won't be too surprised to see how his name called. If if he's there when that but when the numbers start ticking over to two as in into the twenties, go up, up, just go up and get him. The thought of having him, Aleem, and DJ Reader at the defensive tackle position arouses me quite frankly. It is that good, and then Broderick's free to develop behind them. But yeah, yeah. Spoiler, yeah, he's number one for me as well. So <laughs> it's never going to be a given there. In terms of the rest for the defensive tackles for me, again, I've sort of got a little plethora of guys who offer something a little bit different here. So this is me specific for the Lions rather than maybe they've been the best overall. Number five, I've got Jam Reed Crowbar. So he's the James Madison defensive tackle. You heard a lot about him from Rye over the years, but he's just coming off a superb season, 19 and a half tackles for loss, 10 sacks. In terms of the read assigning now, now that we got Broderick, maybe it makes sense to have more of a pass rushing threat as well, like Aleem. And, you know, if you want to develop him, absolutely fine. But Cromar's a very interesting prospect because, again, he fits the size. He's 6'4", he's 275. Maybe you just want him to bulk up just a little bit, but you've got to play him at the three tech. And he's just shown an innate ability to get through some what really good offensive lines in the Sun Belt. And against Power 5 opposition, when he's played against them as well, he's just had this little extra edge about him. And I'm very intrigued. So if I'm going to go a developmental pass rush in DT to help flesh out the room, I would want him there. So Jeremy Prome is at five. Evan Anderson is at number four. So he's the nose tackle from Florida Atlantic, you will have heard us speak about him before. He's the guy, he was 360 at one point. He's a big, beefy boy. But what really was intriguing is he's dropped to 320 now. And during the Shrine Bowl, and you saw the practices, because he's dropped that weight, there's a pass rushing side to him that not a lot of people have seen. There's a, no, there's a run stuff in nose tackle. He's really good. Kind of like a lean when he was coming out of college a little bit. He reminds me of the, you know, the run... The run game ability was never in doubt. It's can he rush the passer a bit more? Because he's dropped so much weight, he actually had a lot of success in the pass rushing drills. And you've just seen enough there to be curious. to be like, if you want another hybrid DT, we'll do both. Who's going to go completely under the radar if you don't want to spend a big pick on them? Evan Anderson is going to be the guy. So, again, I'd love to see him in the colours if we get so if we don't go off early. Number three... Go a little higher. Here, Chris Jenkins from Michigan. For me, the best run stuffer in terms of defensive tackles in this draft. And that Michigan team has been amazing. He was in my half-season mock draft. I've not fallen out of love with him. I think he's really good, but for primarily a run stuffing purposes. And he's got the kind of mentality you want on this team as well. Again, very tough nut to crack. I would, I would still put a pick on him there. So he's at number three. Obviously, we know Chazane's at number two. Number two, Christian Boyd. I don't know about you, right? But so his offseason started at the Hula Bowl, the very first All Star game we did. Then he got called up to the Shrine Bowl. Then he went to the Combine. He's had a pro day where everybody turned out to see him. Like, if there's going to be an FCS prospect that goes big in year one in the NFL next year, Boyd feels like it. Start with the run, but he's a very underrated pass rusher as well. And you're going to look at him probably in comp pick territory, you know, towards the end of day two, maybe just at the start of day three, if you get lucky, I think that's going to be incredibly good value for him. And again, someone who I think we would like, I know they've looked at him. So Boyd would be up there as the next guy I want if we can't get Jazane. So a lot of intriguing prospects at DT if you go outside of some of the bigger names there. Let's move it on to the edge, right? Defensive ends, who have you got ranked in your top five? This has chopped and changed a lot for me, so the guy I was super high on before the whole thing started is now at five. Braylon Trice, for me, is probably, he might be falling out the first round. And now if you're looking for an edge rusher, Right, so I think he had 88 pressures across the last two years. Like he was like the most electric. Might like, say he was the highest motor. Didn't convert always into sacks, but he's very good against the run. Might like, say which to his credit does help. But 
for me, the combine, it was bad. He tested really poorly. Like, he showed very little actual agility, even across the drills. Like, he just didn't look good. He looks a bit slow, a bit stiff. And for me, a lot of guys have jumped him. I still think he'll be a very good player at next level. But you're going to have to respect the fact that he's a good run stopper. I'm not sure how. We're going to have to see how he wins off the edge now because it won't be using as athletic skills. At four, I've got Chop Robinson. I'd say he, there's just something about him, like I say, he's, he's compact, he's explosive, he just kind of can breeze past people on the outside. He's not the biggest guy, but yeah, it he just, he just feels like he's going to be a natural finisher at next level. I don't think I'll want Alt to do with him in the wrong game. I don't think I'd, I'd trust him. I don't think he could hold the edge on his own, but as a natural pass rusher, edge rusher, I, I think he might just have it. But I don't know if I want to take that gamble here. I say I feel like he might just be gone one try. He's not something I move up for. But three, it's Jared Verse. He's the blend of run stopper, pass rusher, leader, with a, a good motor, and he's got the physical tools to match and hold his own on the outside. He's a well-built guy, and he's someone that I really do like, and I respect him, I say. He has been dominant on that Florida State line for the last two years. And two, surprisingly, is Dallas Turner. He's not my number one. And I know Dallas Turner will be the first take, and he's probably a top 10 draft pick, but for me, he's not my number one edge rusher. I know he's done it on the biggest stage. I know he's flashy. I know by far he's like one of the most athletically gifted players that will have his name called this year and will be an absolute maybe lock for offensive, uh, defensive rookie of the year. I think he's going to do great things at the next level and he's going to terrorise opposing offences, just how the how just well put together he is and how what the headaches and problems he'll cause offensive linemen. But for me, Number one edge rusher is Liatu Latu. I say, if you're looking for a guy that is the most polished, has the best arsenal, has the most tools, is the smartest guy, and has dominated offensive lines for the last two years and racked up silly amount of stats, and looked like every bit of an athletic beast at the combine because all the measurables were up there. If I hear his name get past twenty. I would, I'd sell a farm. I would move up nine places, even if it cost me 20, 25 high capital. I will go and get him. I expect, don't even let him get to 21. I'll literally trip nine spots. I think he's the best edge rusher in the class. I think he's the most ready to start day one and could be an absolute menace for years to come at the next level. I love him. I think he's the best. I disagree. Like, Overcome the neck injury. There's, there's just so much there. Yeah, some to teams like did not want to know. Some teams won't touch the guy. No. Like I said, some team doctors said, we won't let you play. Other team doctors said, screw it, why not? We think you're fine. And he went out there and he kicked a shit out of offensive line for two years. Is it a massive risk? Could he have a recurrence? Who knows? But in between now and then, he's going to have a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Is it fair to say, I think... Like Chuck Robinson, he's the Marmite in this draft. You love him or you hate him. Like, it's just the lack of production in college at Penn State for me. I don't know whether it's – is that unfair? I just feel like the lack of production is like Summit's not there. Not at 29, anyhow. Not with these guys going. Um, see, he didn't have a lot of competition because that – is it Isaac Ad Ad Adina? Like, he's the other one. Isaac Adina, yeah. like, He's got even worse production. I trust him even less. People still bought boast about both of them. They yeah. both worry me. Yeah, and it, you know, it's not like they've had any studs at defensive tackle either who've been getting I don't yeah. know. He's too small, isn't he? He's only like yeah. six, two and a half. So yeah. Something's screaming like at a Tom Yee were at me with him, and I'm just like, no, but who knows? It it, it it could be, but I just don't like I think it's a lazy comparison for him at 29 for us. I just think that's way too high. Anywho, I get to my five defensive ends. So I've got a mix of day three and day ones here in terms of my top five likes for the Lions. So number five, um, another HBCU prospect, Sunday Arthur Anderson from Grambling. He's 6'4", 245 pounds. I just see a lot. Like, 
James Houston played down at the HBCUs. He kind of got overlooked, but this guy's relentless. He's got the frame. He's got the bend. He's kind of got everything you want in a developmental edge player. If that's the route you're going to go, maybe we're going to double dip. He could be a second guy later on after a high pick, but I watch him and thankfully Joe for to the guys at HBCU, you know, draft HBCU players. They do a lot of work on these guys. So you get to see intimately a little bit more how they play and just, I love the guy's motor. I love his athletic ability and I love his build. I think you're going to be able to mold him perfectly at the next level. So if you're going to go day three, Sunday Arthur Anderson would be the guy I want here. Number four is Mo Camera from Colorado State. We talked about him earlier. You know, I just think he's going to be another development guy, but I think he's going to surprise a lot of people in what he's going to end up as a finished product at the next level. Three, I've got Law two. That's not saying he's the third best in class. It is. I wouldn't go up to get him like I would to my number one, but I think if we're going to get him here, I think it would be amazing. Rise already mentioned about it's just in terms of he is a little smaller, his arms are a little shorter, but what always trumps that, right? Technique. Technique and how much pass rush arsenal you've got on you. And as far as all these edge rushes go, apart from number two on my list, He's got as many moves as humanly possible. So he'll beat you anyway. He'll set you up. He plays mind games and wins that way. So I would have no, no qualms whatsoever having him here. Number two, I've got my Troy guy, Javen Solomon. I've just been so impressed by him. He's had his 16 and a half sacks this year. But like I say, Troy, first and foremost, they throttle your run game. And that comes from the defensive line, both from the interior and the edge setting the edge, giving teams nothing. And him and Gibano do this as good as any edge in this draft class going. And with his pass rush side, again, he's he's like Latu. He's undersized, but he's got the entire pass rush arsenal. It's on tape. Every single move you could want, he has. And so he's able to overcome his abilities has been a little bit smaller. And I think he's just a perfect Lions player. I do. And I think he's going to go really high in this draft. But Javon Solomon's right up there for me, but he's behind my number one. I shall love this. I've got Jared Verse. If I'm going to do a guilty pleasure move in this draft, if I'm really going to move high in this draft for anyone other than Jose Newton, it would be Jared Verse. Again, a guy who has started out at Albany. He's worked his way up the tough way through the FCS, has got his break at Florida Stakes. Don't forget, he came in just after Jermaine Johnson got drafted and they lost all that production on the D-line. And he's like, I don't care if I'm an FCS guy, I'm going to come up, I'm going to be the leader here, I'm going to replace all those sacks and more. And he's just devastating. You pair verse with Aiden Hutchinson and it's over for the NFC North. He's my absolutely guilty pleasure at the position. So Jared Verse gets the nod there. All right, let's move on. Just a couple of position groups to go. We're now on the linebackers. Uh, interesting linebacker class here, right? Who is in the top five? Uh, so, I found it really hard to rank these guys. So, at number four, or five, I've got Jeremiah Trotter from Clemson. Like you say, he is well put together. He's compact, he's strong, physical, he's very well respected. Like I say good in run support. He's decent in coverage. Like I say, he hits hard. Like I say, the hands are decent. He is I think I'd say he's well well experienced now. I'd say he's one of the higher prospects. Like I say, came out of high school well. Like I say, Clemson have always done pretty well linebacker. I'd say he's had a fairly strong career, good build. I, I'm not sure what, like, you know, these are a lot of these guys going to be very scheme dependent, but I feel like he is going to be someone that will be a rotational piece at first, but eventually could earn a starting job at the next level. Like I say, I think he's going to be a solid day two option for a team there. At four, I've got Jalen Ford, Texas. I just love the kid. I say, tested well, passed the eye test, like I say, and also watching the film, I say, in the box, like I said, the guy hits like a Ford F1. Like I said, he comes downhill and he uses every bit of that, like 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, His torpedo, a really good box linebacker. But also, he has got speed. He can backpedal. 
he can drop in a coverage. He can deceive a quarterback if he wanted to. Like I say he could drop into a passing lane, get the hands up for the big frame. I feel like he's going to be a kind of like a jack of all trades kind of guy that I'd expect him to also really make his impact on special teams. I think that's where he'll do really well there. At two, I've got a, a Jaron Cooper. So a Texas A&M kid. Like, I think he's just, he's so well-rounded. Like I say, he's kind of just gone out, like I say, being a, a massive star recruit for me. He's lived up to most of that, like I say, the A&M, the Aggies defense. He's kind of been really crucial to him, anchoring that midfield. I trust him in run stuffing a lot more than other guys on this list. I feel like he has got a real strong nose for the football. He can tackle. He won't shy away. He can also pass, rush the passer, which some of these guys can't do. I do trust him to come up to the line and then blitz and get through and be able to finish. I feel like he is a proper finisher. And I, I really do like that about him, that he does have that ability to stun, fake, and also be a pass rush weapon at next level. Number two, I've got Cedric Gray. I kind of fall over the UNC linebacker. Like I say, yeah. the things he'll do, I think he's the kind of guy that screams to me like he'll get a pick six in his rookie year or summer. Like I say, great in coverage. Like I say, he's happy to pick up a running back out of the midfield or go up against a tight end in the slot that breaks out on an hour running breaking route. I feel like he's got the range. He's got the coverage skills to go across and stick with them and then be able to bring them down if needs be. So a good hand-eye recognition. But also, he's not afraid of tackling. Like you said, good size. He can wrap up. I say he's a good tackler in the open field. And I think I think he's one of those guys that he might get taken later, but I reckon he could have quite an impact for rookie season on field and on special teams. I think he'll just do really well. And number one, like I said, I've got Peyton Wilson. Now, some guys will be like, maybe more of an outside linebacker stand-up or like a pure linebacker. For me, I think he'll play the natural position. I can see him as an inside linebacker, despite being massive and rangy. And I know he's got red flags for his issues, but the athleticism, the the motor, the the not taking players off, the coverage skills, the, the willingness to go out there and just put his body on the line. Tackling, he, he'll need some work. Like I say, he's a big rangy guy, like I say, can not take the odd bad angle, like I say, can't overstep, like I say, he's a big guy with big strides and he does have to slow down a little bit and square up to guys, but yeah, he has got, the guy's built like a condor, the reach, the height, the, the speed, he's got the things you can't teach, all it is is the things that you can teach him, he's got everything else, and like I say, some guys will look at him and think, the things you could do with him, he mm. will be like a proper Swiss army knife, he will play, like I say, on the end, might have his hand in the dirt, could have blitzing, could then drop back into coverage. Like he's kind of, he's gonna be a do it all, jack of all trades kind of guy. And some teams that's like don't interest them. Some like, yeah, we want him. And I think he's gonna be taken pretty highly. And the the injury history and that, I'm hoping that's all behind him now and teams will hold that against him. And like I say he could have a long, prosperous career in the NFL. And for me, yeah, I've just got him first because like I say he's got the tools, the skills. And he's put it together this year and last year, like I say, it's actual real field production. Guy's been a menace. The yeah. tackling, like, it's ridiculous numbers. Yeah. So, the spoiler, he's my number one as well. And for that reason, because I think his future, he will be a team captain inside middle linebacker. That will be his role and duty. But that is when you can deploy that edge ability about him. If you want to scheme him up, some extra looks. If you want to do something extra with him, move him around, like you said, a little Swiss Army knife, I think he's going to be perfect. Like, he's a really good edge rusher in his own right, so you can bring him up and do that. But first and foremost, he'll be a team captain. He'll be leader of a defense one day. He will be the first and foremost captain calling all the plays out. He's he's just amazing. Um, but in terms of the other linebackers, I've got a lot of guys I like. I think out of the, the development linebackers, there's some of my favorite developmental guys in here. Number five, I've got, and I had to move these around all over the place as well because I wasn't sure. I've got Tyrese Knight. He's the UTEP Knights inside middle linebacker. He's one of the best run defenders in terms of pure instinct against the run. Now, the CUSA, 
lot of run heavy teams there. You come up against good caliber of running back. So he's not against slob opposition here in terms of when you see him on the ball, how he can, you know, blow up runs, how he can diagnose them before they even happen. He's tough as nails, a little undersized, doesn't really matter. Um, he's one of the best at it. And if you're going to be able to develop him, big special team, and you bring him up through the special teams and you bring him in as a run specialist at the linebacker position over time. And I think he's going to be a very good player. So nice in there at five. At number four, a player who I've completely fallen in love with, Aaron Casey from Indiana. A couple of years ago, um, when Malcolm Rodriguez was coming out, it was kind of the thing. I just got vibes about him that he was going to be much more than the sum of his parts in the NFL and that anyone was giving him credit for. Aaron Casey is, I think, again, going to be a very good linebacker at the NFL level. He's very experienced, um, coming off 20 tackles for loss and six and a half sacks this year, as well as 109 total tackles, three forced fumbles. You talk about a guy who's built like a chunk of iron, but moves incredibly quickly this is the guy and on an Indiana team, which quite frankly is terrible. So he just does not get the love nor the time of day. He's an excellent special teamer. He will get straight into the thick of things on your special teams while you bring him in as a proper true inside linebacker who can do both parts of the game. He can rush the passer. He can stop the run. And I'm getting Emrod vibes off him in terms of if he goes on day three to us, I would absolutely Love it. Number three is Edith Juan Olafosio, another who I've had a long love affair with, but I'm back on him. Very, very tough career through college. You know, he was going to be a big pit once upon a time until injuries completely derailed him and broke him. But he's managed to fight his way back into that Washington team. And in terms of sort of the rangy, lengthy linebackers, the guys who can cover a lot of ground really quickly, especially to catch some of the quicker running backs who are able to get through, he's the guy. Like, again, it's just going to be a mainstay on the inside of your linebacker core for you know, five, six, seven years, however long you want it to be as soon as he develops. Yes, the injury history is there. You've got to be careful with it, but you're picking him day three. So, you know, not too much risk associated, but you can get a lot more for your value there. Number two, and with the right, I've got Cedric Gray. Like, five picks in the last three years, like this is one of the better coverage linebackers as well. You saw during the All-Star games, if he wasn't making a play against the run, he was making a play against the pass. If you want one of the better coverage linebackers who isn't going to cost you the world, he's there. And and like Ryan, there's just something about him, especially that game. And now I've watched more of his tape that's just driven me towards him. I think he's going to be maybe the sleeper diamond of the linebacker class there. And number one is Peyton Wilson. I will say no more. I'm an NC State fan, so I'll be accused of being biased, but in terms of just his hybrid ability, but first and foremost, been an inside linebacker, that will hold him in great stead at the next level. He's a really good edge rusher in his own right. So those are my top five for linebackers when it comes to the Lions. And then we get into the secondary. So we have this interesting conversation about whether this, who knows who's going to come up in here. We'll do corners first, but if any of them are hybrids, don't get upset with us because you know what players are like these days. They're very scheme versatile, but corners, this is very interesting. If you're doing your top five for the draft, there's so much, you know, discrepancy here. I'm very intrigued. Who are your top five corners in the draft? Ryan McCluskey. As you say, they're scheme dependent. So I've got corners and then I've got DBs as kind of separate. So if we're talking corners, so honourable mention is Nehemiah Pritchett, I'd say, out of Auburn. I think, I just feel like he's got the skill to be like an upside ro ro uh, rotational player that could very quickly, quickly be thrust into a starter role, whether that's winning it or through injury. I feel like he can hold his own and be an average above side player pretty quickly. That's that that's quite difficult to be a corner in your rookie year. At five, I've got TJ Tampa. So I've got the uh, Iowa State product. Clocks in at like say six one and a half, six two. I'd say he's a ball hawk. I'd say that can tackle plenty of turnovers in the last few years. He has been a a proper rock on the outside for the Cyclones. He is not shy away from contact. Tests well. He's young. 
He's got the size that a lot of teams crave on the outside because he can go up against bigger body guys. He can match up physically against some guys that a lot of guys just can't, and he's able to overpower them at line of scrimmage. And I feel like I've seen, can't remember who it was, someone mocked him a couple of weeks ago to 29 at Lions. I was, a lot of people were a bit taken aback by it. I kind of see it, but I don't know. I, a very early round two prospect, but he's got upside to one of the better rookies starting straight away. Four, I have Kool-Aid. And that's not because I don't like him. It's because the fact, like I say, he can switch off there, sometimes does lose concentration, can give up big plays, but will also make big plays on the other end and can generate turnovers. Players of a bit, he borders the line of swagger and straight arrogance very finely. He tours the line, I feel like, and you'll probably get that next level. He's going to run his mouth. He's going to give some shit, I say, but I expect him to back it up as well. I feel like we're firmly in a range of where he'll go. Everyone else from three upwards, I think, will be long gone. At three, I've got Terry and Arnold. He's a, his running mate. And I kind of think the gap between where they're taking could be quite large. I think Terry Arnold is more polished. Like I say I think he's more of what you call lockdown. There may be less turnovers, but there might be a lot less completion rate. Like I say he's physical. He's just a strong kid. Like I say, holds his own, can play bigger guys, and we'll just go out there. And yeah, he's great, and he's just physical and strong, and just understands routes, understands leverage, plays the game just really well. At two, I've got Nate Wiggins. Like the guy just exudes effort. I say you only have to look at the ninety-nine yard force fumble for the end zone. Just just does not just didn't give up on a player and then made one of the best, most exciting plays of the whole year. And despite like a niggling injury, still went at the combine, still put on an absolute smoke show. He is athletically he's a he's a star in it. The kid could be a hurdler or a track runner. And I feel like, yeah. I feel like I'd love him in the Lions, but I feel like he's going way out of our range. I say he's going to be one of the one of the first corners take off the board and just start very quickly. And Clemson, another place that just produced stellar defensive back play. I say he's a smart kid. He knows what he's doing, and he should hold his own at next level very well. Uh, number one, a year ago, I didn't know Quinion Mitchell what. I don't think I did anywhere. But yeah, the biggest riser for me for the entire draft. If you go back two months. Three months, a bit of murmur, a bit of chatter. Like you say, he goes through the ball process, he gets the measurements. Kid, God, the kid's six foot one. Like you say, he's a physical outside imposing corner. Then Toledo have a great year, and people like they start seeing him when they're watching other people. Like, who's that kid? Like you say, and then he gets the the all star game invite where he's, he's locking up guys, he's forcing incompletions against some of the best receivers in the nation, and then just casually goes to the combine and just just puts on an absolute clinic of athletic prowess. And now for most people, he is their number one corner. And like I say, he's going like top 15, top 20, and just won't be anywhere near we're going to get up without giving up like a first round pick to move up all the way. And honestly, the kids earned it. Like I say, the Rockets product, I couldn't be happy with him if he goes for top 15. Like I said, I think he will do the business at the next level. And he will go up against some of the best guys day one. And like I say, he'll show that he is no slouch coming from a small school. And he's earned every right to be there. So, yeah, I, he's one of the most exciting players for me to watch as a rookie. I'll be watching the kid like a hawk to see how he does. But, yeah, a very strong contender for defensive rookie of the year. He is going to be thrown on an island straight away. But I think he's kind of earned that right. Hot take, but you're right. He could be got the size, got the length, and you know, locked down some good players. So interesting, but yeah, Quinya Mitchell caught about one few months ago. Like I said just just wouldn't have seen it happening. So this is what can happen. It's the fun of the draft. Um, right, corners for me again. I sort of don't mind specific. I'm actually quite good. It's worked out this way. I'm going kind to of done a little bit different with our rankings here. So. I've gone down the ball hawk lane, so for corners, because we've got a lot of experienced corners in Detroit now, and we're avoiding that co topic of conversation today, just for now. 
We've got plenty of experienced corners on the team. So, again, maybe someone we can develop over time. At number five, I've got Reddy Stewart. He is the Troy cornerback. And, again, one of the guys I am most intrigued about in this entire process because he comes from a small school, but you would not think he has. So, in the last two years alone, seven interceptions, 22 passes defended. He's got two pick sixes in that time as well. In the air, he's one of the best you're going to get that you can find here. He's 5'11", he's 173, he's just scrappy. And this Troy team, again, DBs, you've got to be very committed to fighting against the run here. He's certainly plenty enthusiastic about it. There is refinement that is needed in his game. He's going to be a day three pick. But in terms of if you want a guy who straight away is going to be a great pass, you know, great against the pass, he will do it, and he's got all the attributes you want to be an all-round corner. And again, he he smacks of underdog, like sort of Jerry Jacobs type thing. He's going to be written off by a lot of people for his size and where he's come from, and he's just going to prove a lot of people wrong. But I really like Reddy Stewart, and he's, again, one of the Troy contingent I wouldn't be ashamed to see here. Number four, uh, staying in the Sun Belt, actually, I've got Micker Abraham from Marshall. He was in my preseason teams. He's been in my midseason mock drafts. He's been a consistent guy all along for these five years at Marshall. But his last two years, again, very impressive. 10 interceptions, 25 pass breakups, forced fumble in there as well, 72 tackles. Does a little bit behind the line of scrimmage as well. Does go hunting for the quarterback a little bit as well. But in terms of a long rangy corner he's 6'2 175 and he's kind of a hybrid he does play a little bit of safety he's kind of like one of these tweeners but he's got the perfect size he's got the perfect frame and again the intelligence to make plays on the ball in the air and he's going to be completely overlooked in a class of really wonderful corners you're going to get some steals on day three this year you'll get starters sooner rather than later because of the amount of good corners going abraham he might not even get drafted but he will be an NFL caliber player in my view. So I've got him there at four, three. I've got the wild card, the HBCU wild card again, Mikey Victor, Alabama state. He's doing his pro day today. He got an invite to Alabama to do his pro day. A lot of buzz about him. And again, a guy who has got such potential at the next level, he's six, three, 212. So again, you're talking long rangy corners who have a nose for the ball he's got three picks 21 pass breakups in his last couple of years and he's fought up the hard way started off in the fbs gone down to alabama state and worked his way through and again just shows a natural nose for the ball for breaking up passes for again works very well against the run he's got the body got the frame got the size that you want to be good against the run and in the air. Uh, and the fact that he's playing for HBCU means nothing. Two years ago, Joshua Williams won a Super Bowl in his rookie year, coming from Fayetteville State. The HBCUs, they create very good corner prospects. And a lot of people were down on Williams when he was drafted as well. He went round four. Mikey's probably going to go round four, round five. And he's going to be one of the next good corners to come from there. And I would be intrigued in this happening because I want someone with his length, his size, someone a little taller um number two ryan's favorite player max melton from rutgers i just have a very very soft spot for max melton his again he's played on a rough team but he's succeeded you know he superseded all his expectations again very tough very physical nose through the ball in there it's kind of been the theme of the guys that i really wanted for us it's need turnovers from that corner position but you also want a guy who's he's faced up He's faced that Michigan team several times. That run game, that physical run style, you know. The Big Ten, you've got to defend against the run because a lot of teams, that's all they're good at. And he's passed with flying colours in that regard. He's probably going to go high. What do you reckon? High day two for him now, Ryan? I think he's I think he's in that category. Yeah, would you I think say? he's pending for a third rounder. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think so. So I think he's fully worthy of that. And then number one, he's been my guy for a while now. Chris Abrams drain. He's the corner one straight away. Very cerebral. In that backfield, you've had him, Ennis Rackestraw, Jalen Carleys. That Missouri secondary has been great these last couple of years. But Abram's drain for me. He doesn't get a lot of love. 
but he's instinctual as they come. Like a lot of people see wasted movement and plays off on his plays. I just see a guy who knows what's happening. He knows when he's not involved in a play, he knows when he doesn't need to expend his energy. But when he's on, his eyes are always on the quarterback, always on the receiver, always where they need to be, rarely gets caught out of position. And like I say, he's just as instinctual as they get. And with the right training, he's going to be a lockdown corner one at the next level. And you're not going to have to pay what you are for the other guys. You'll get him day two. I think he's just, he's completely and utterly underrated. So Chris Abrams trains me number one at cornerback. And let's finish this off with the DBs, safeties, DBs, hybrid guys. Let's get in there. Your final top five, Ryan. I think this is my, one of my favorite groups of players because I see there's a lot of guys here that can do a lot of things. So at five, I have Cam Kinchins. Now he's lower because mm, a bit reckless, a bit sloppy. But if you're looking for a guy to hit, hit hard and make his presence felt, that's him. I say the guy is a torpedo. He is known for being a ferocious tackler. Sometimes a bit overzealous in his attempts. Probably going to be penalised the next level. But yeah, he can dislodge the play. He can make the big play. He can generate the turnover. It's the consistency he needs to work on. I say protecting himself, putting not putting himself in harm's way. But I feel like people will like him. That 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 real grit. Like say. Head down, go in, I say, hopefully dislodge the ball or bring the guy down. So, yeah, just need some refinement and tweaking. But some guys will love him as a, as a package on the back end. The four, I've got Cole Bishop, a massive riser in this offseason because he tested in. He measured better than a lot of people would like to say, no, he's 6'2, like 205. He's got a really good, strong build for safety. And I say he, he kind of went under the radar at Utah, despite having a good nose for the ball and getting a good amount of interceptions. I say tackles for lost safety is like the kind he can do it all. He can play free safety, he can play strong safety, he can pick the ball off, he can tackle. I say he can force incompletions. I say a good, decent tag, completion tag, and when taken. So for me, I've seen a lot of people starting to warm to him as a kind of guy that can move around that defense and play. Both roles in the safety position. I think I like, say he'll do really well. There's three. I've got Tyke Smith. Now that's because this kid can play hundreds of snaps at strong safety, free safety, nickel corner, which I expect him to potentially start at the next level. And that is a position that is garnering more and more high level analysis and depth now as a pro. You start in dimes, rovers, bandits, whatever you want to call them. Now, crucial now to defences to play five defensive backs. And we don't have a slot for him, but I still think the Tyke Smith of the West Virginia days before he made the transfer, like he's had injuries, but he's had some good play at Georgia, it's still there. And I still think the scheme versatility he offers, the physical, still got a nose for the ball. Like I said, I still think he can become a competent start next level. And I still think he can offer someone all a lot of good player at like say three or four positions. I won't surprise to see him at some snaps outside corner. Then you see him at deep safety. And you see him on a linebacker or a running back out the backfield corner on the nickel. So I think someone's gonna have a lot of fun because he's a he's a proper chess piece that you can move around. And he, he's got decent build to him. Now this is where the shock comes. So my favorite defensive player in the nation is not number one. He, he's been bumped down a peg. I've got Cooper Dijon at two. And that is because I don't know if he can play corner, outside corner, as well as he can play all the roles combined at the next level. And that's why I, I, I don't know if I could take him at 29. Like I say, he is an elite punt returner. He offers special teams. He offers everything I want in a guy. A free safety, a strong safety, also a nickel. He can do everything, tight keeper, better and more consistent. Can he go on an island at corner? I don't know. And some people will draft him. I've seen the Packers take him at 26 in mocks, and they're going to play him at corner. Because like I said they've literally just signed Xavier McKinney, so they don't need the safety. And yeah, he'll either live or die on that hill. He could be the best defensive player in the draft, or he could struggle. And he could be like, I need you to put me back at safety when I'm past that. 
but you can't use that kind of capital, people say of safety. So I don't know. I find it really hard, and he's my favourite player, and I love him, but it will be all be about scheme dependent. Like I said, if you don't fit in the right scheme, then he might get exposed. But he also could have go out there and just be the best jack of all trades, pick up for the house defensive year and almost on him to like thirty three and he'd be a travesty. So that'd be hard. And number one, my new best defensive D B slayer safety. And controversial because Tyler Newbin has missed thirty five tackles in his career at Minnesota. And that's a lot. And that's bad. But if you want a coverage player, I say, and that forces incompletions, and frankly, for me, a safety is a shutdown in the passing game, it's him. I saw a mock today and it saw it got, he went to 26 to the Packers and I was puked. Him and Xavier McKinney, I don't want that in the AFC North because I think that'd be a perfect tandem. That'd be someone great from a rail. And I think Tyler Newbin, he's a fringe first rounder. And a lot of people don't want to hear that. Because the tackling is being an issue. But elite coverage player, turnovers, like I say, lots of interceptions, passes defended, just like I say, keeping everything in front of him, he's the best safety in the class. And there's no two ways about it. But when things get behind him, or he has to make a tackle in the open field, it all gets a little bit eerie. Like I say, so he's got huge drawbacks, but if he can work on them, and overcome them and improve them, then it kind of might warrant a first round pick. I can kind of see the hype, like say, because safety now. I know we've just seen a lot of them cut in cost saving by a lot of teams, but from still, me still, it is a premier position. And a team that just cut a safety might spend the top 50 pick on safety just to get the rookie contract. So, yeah, I think Tyler Newbin, he, I think he'll be a star or his lack of ability to tackle in the open field will mean. Like he's in like the UFL in like two years and it turned out to be a disaster. It'll only go one way, but I'm banking that his ability to be a lockdown safety will overcome those glaring issues of bad angles he takes. Yeah, see, again, so with safeties, because they have so much to do in regards to, you know, they're the primary guys they bring up for the run and stuff like that. I feel like you can get away with a few more missed tackles as a safety, especially in college. I feel like that, you know, it's a little more difficult. So, see, I've got him at one as well. I'm the same. I think he is going to be great at the next level. Do, do we need, I feel like we need a veteran safety. Do we need him? Maybe not. But at the same time, I wouldn't be disappointed. And you got to think, Minnesota, you know, Antoine Winfield has come from there. Benjamin St. Juiced. Like, in recent years, the DBs they produce are high caliber. Winfield's won himself of Super Bowl. He's one of the best guys at his position there so you know i wouldn't bet against the pedigree either so I, I do agree with you he's right up there for me in terms of other guys i've got we agree on a few of these so number five i've got jalen carlies he's the missouri safety um who i had in my preseason team actually he had a little bit of a down year by his standards but i still think he's going to be great at the next level so he's got a nice tall long frame he's exactly he's pretty much got if he's measurements uh, but he's played at safety his entire college career rather than if he played at outside corner. But again, sort of in that really good Missouri secondary, he's been really good. He's really physical. He's good against the run. You know, anticipation. He's got the instinct, the anticipation you need there. He's very disciplined. And he's got a lot of picks in his time and he returns them for a lot. He's actually quite, you know, once he's got the ball in his hands, he returned it a long way on you. But um yeah, in terms of, again, he's got a frame that you want to develop at that position. So I do like Carly's from that point. The wild card again, PJ Jules. So he's the Southern Illinois safety. And I know there's a lot of buzz about him. And the reason why, like his IQ is stupidly good playing. He's a guy, he's the gambler. If you don't mind a guy who gambles, like 95% of the time, he can correctly gamble in a situation, whether it's he's going to cut a route, whether he's going to come up against the run. You see it all over his tape. He's a man who likes to gamble. And most of the time he gets it right. Now, at the NFL level, a few times you don't, you get punished. It's, and that's going to be the problem with him at the next level. You've kind of got to cut it out a little bit. But again, he's he's one of Feldman's freaks, freakishly athletic. Again, taller, 6'2". 
So he's got every sort of toolsy little bit you need about him there. He's got the IQ. It's just can you cut out those little mistakes that he makes? And of course, coming from the FCS as well. So the step up in the opposition is there. But he's a very intriguing prospect to put down your chart and work the way up. Like he's got everything you want to succeed. So PJ Jules is there at four. And then at three, I've got Tyke Smith. You've already mentioned him. Long been a fan of his. Very, you know, very good collegiate career, ruined by injury, but he's been healthy the last few years. His leadership I'd love in our backfield. And then at two, I've got Cole Bishop. Um, so because I had the genres going too high for us. Um, but Bishop, again, I think he screams Lions player. Just go back and look at his shrine ball performance. It's just the dude comes and like he tackles and he finishes. He doesn't have a tackling problem, Cole Bishop. As he gets hands on you, you're down and as physical as it comes. So he's there and then I've got Tyler Newbin at one. And with that, that rounds up our top five for all positions there. So it's been kind of good. Ryan's done top five for the draft. I've done top five for the Lions. You've got a big variation of players in there. So going to be intriguing, isn't it, Ryan? Hopefully we might have landed on at least one player the Lions might like at the top of our, uh, at the top of our picks. I think I'd be pretty upset if they don't draft anyone we've mentioned today. I <laughs> Something's gone wrong, I think. Hey, we could get a niche for being that podcast who you can talk about who they'll just get it all wrong, but you go, you can make a following out of it. Who knows? I like to figure that we do pretty well <laughs> in regards to that anyhow. So, yeah, that is everything from us today. Hopefully you've enjoyed it all. We've gone through the pro days. We've gone through our top five lists. With the draft coming up, if... There's anything you want, any players you want us to look at, any position groups, anything like that, any questions you've got, please let us know. Just put them in the comments, put them in the chat. Like I say, I'll be watching back on, uh, hopefully, when this premieres later on, either tonight or probably tomorrow night now at this point, because it is quite a late one. Just uh, Is there anything else you want to get off chest quickly before we're, we're done today? No. no. I'm ready for the draft now. Exactly. We're, we're, we're about 37 days away. We're not that far at all. Already got the time off and ready to go and it's going to be good fun. Um, Quickly, in terms of next shows, so as I say, for the main Detroit Lions podcast, this upcoming Monday, we're going to be starting our positional group looks for the draft. It's starting with the offensive line, so come and join us on Monday for that. And for myself and Ryan, we will be back next week. The show's going on now and it's going to be a good one because by popular demand, I've eventually managed to get him back. We are going to be doing our slightly delayed HBCU show. We are going to go over the legacy ball, the last year in HBCU football, all the draft prospects. And we're going to do it with our favorite guest, Gerald J. Huggins coach. We're looking forward to having him back on. So if you have any questions in regards to that, he will answer anything you want to know about HBCU football. So I'm not sure exactly what day it'll be on you. Need to chat with him about it, but we're looking forward to that. That's going to be a good one. And again, is there anything else you really want us to discuss on the way? Because we're getting to that point now where we're going to start winding this season down because the draft is coming in preparation for next. So if you want us to do before the season ends, let us know. But anyhow, you know where to find us. Roar of the Lines UK all over the internet. Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, all that good stuff. Just type it in. You'll find us. Just remains for me to thank Ryan. Been a good evening, and we shall see you again very soon. One pride. <laughs>